Forum Borealis Paradigm Expansion Greetings from the North, citizens of Earth. Welcome to Forum Borealis. Today we have a Norwegian guest with us, and this chap is a rare breed indeed, because he's actually an honest journalist, or rather an old school publisher and editor in chief, yet completely sincere and dedicated to the now lost principles and ideals of media as truth telling and honest reporting rather than spewing propaganda and fake news on behalf of the powers that be. In fact, he has his war scars to prove it. And I became aware of him through one of these battles. To great cost and personal expense, he has stood firm on the barricades, never yielding to innumerable attempts of pressure, bullying, smears, blackmail, threats and seductions. In his newspapers, readers are enlightened about forbidden and censored matters, such as 9-11 facts, Assange and WikiLeaks, false flag matters. Snowden and the surveillance tyranny, the crimes of Israel, the dangers of 5G and AMS, also called smart meters, the COVID-19 pandemic, and so on. Since we are launching a new series, Deconstructing the Fake Stream Media, he is a great fellow to converse with about such topics, including his own experience of what happens when an honest actor in the press actually tries to do his job. Very enlightening in order to understand how almost entire shame stream press have ended up in utter corruption as the empire's mouthpiece. Truls Olaf Lee is an IT innovator who graduated in media, economics and ICT at Agda District College from 79 to 82. In the 80s, he established two software companies, Microsoftware AS and Vega Software AS, before a four-year study of philosophy at the University of Oslo, New School in New York and Berkeley University in California. In 93, Lee decided to go into media and purchased the old long-standing conservative newspaper, More Than Blada, or the morning paper, which was about to go under. Under him as editor-in-chief, it was changed from tabloid format back to full format, and the newspaper's profile gained an increased intellectual and cultural character. After having successfully resuscitated it to sustainability, he sold it in 2003 and moved on to found the Nordic edition of esteemed French system critical newspaper Le Monde Diplomatique. He was editor-in-chief for this until he sold it in 2007 and bought it back in 2010. Lee then became general manager of the newspaper, where he also wrote regularly about movies. In 2015, he decided to revive another newspaper called Nitid or Modern Times, which, which was an old socialist paper that was also at the verge of imploding. He relaunched it with a new visual and editorial touch. Under him as editor-in-chief, the newspaper has been reworked from a weekly to a monthly paper, now non-partisan yet power critical, with a focus on conflict, economy, corruption, the control structures and ecology. In 2016, the popular left-wing daily newspaper Klasse Kampen or Class Struggle opted to let Nitid be attached as a regular monthly supplement in addition to its own single sales and subscription. A decision they soon would regret, as they had no editorial control over the contents of Nitid, and an incident occurred that led Klassikampen to be exposed for not being such a system-critical media as their own image pretended to and popular belief would have it. Namely, a series of critical articles in Nitid on 9-11, exposing the suppressed sober facts and raising the correct rational questions leading from them. 
Nitid was immediately terminated by Classic Company, who had the audacity to claim that Nitid had uncritically conveyed claims from the conspiracy milieu, <laughs> whatever that means, hence revealing that they are both anti-intellectual and power-serving gatekeepers. The backlash was even heavier towards Truls Lee as a person, in that everyone across the political spectrum, indeed the entire public, now grabbed their pitchforks and ganged up against him, leading to absurd outcomes, such as the biggest newspaper in Norway, often Posten or the Evening Post, removing an interview with him from their online site, and there was even public calls for having him arrested. <laughs> His courageous and principled stance has exposed that even Norway, that like to pretend we are more enlightened, democratic, scientific, principled, and above the fray, has a debate climate that makes it legitimate and commendable to make the wildest claims about Putin, Russia, Chinese leaders, North Korea, Iran, or right-wing populists and at the same time doesn't dare criticizing Western leaders' countries and its power structure. In other words, our media are subservient poodles rather than watchdogs. But not so with Nitid. In fact, he had already back uh, in 2006 raised the same topic, then through his first paper, Morgenblader, even arranging public forums on the subject of 9-11. But... Back then, the corporate power grab over the media was not so complete yet, and public discourse still more free and intelligent and varied to afford such basic healthy ventures. All the hysteria from the media world was excused by their hypocritical pretense to have a duty to care about credibility, ironically in the process of revealing that they lack any ounce of it. Be that as it may, beyond all the political stuff, Truls is at heart a cultured man and a filmmaker. Between 09 and 14, he was editor-in-chief for the international documentary magazine Docs, published by the European Documentary Network. This work was continued in 17 with short films and interviews in connection with the newspaper's editorial line when New Teed expanded its focus onto international non-fiction and documentary films through an international edition called Modern Times Review, a European documentary full-frame newspaper which also can be accessed online. He has also worked as a film director and international documentary filmmaker with the production company Film AS, among else releasing a film from the 2010 earthquake in Haiti called Der Haiti, What Now? and another in 2012 about Jürgen Leth called The Seduced Human, both films shown at the Norwegian State Broadcasting. He has also made films with focus on the Middle East, such as the documentary about the Norwegian physician and humanitarian Mats Gilbert and his work in Palestine. If you are Scandinavian, I encourage you to support Nitid, where he is still the editor-in-chief, which can also be checked out online. And the same with Modern Times Review, if you are a global citizen interested in documentaries. Welcome to Forum Borealis Trolls. Thank you. Ah, already, I'm uh, crossing the first stumble block. What to call you? <laughs> <laughs> like we discussed before I started the mic. Yeah. You are one of those Norwegians who have a tricky name for the English language. So I just want to make people aware your name is not Trolls. <laughs> no, actually, my name is a little difficult. It's Truls. Uh, when I was studying at Berkeley and I was doing philosophy, everyone was having trouble. So I was, uh, they, somebody called me Jules, another called me Troll. Trolls <laughs> and Tron. So I think we, can, we as Norwegians, we can stick to the Truls. Uh, which is actually a, a term from the, the the god with a hammer, you know, Thor. I was one of his weapons. That's true. So oh. There you have my name's background, yeah. I didn't know that. Hmm. But uh, don't pretend it's as easy in Norwegian, because, uh, you know, for my part of Norway, it will be Truls. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're scurrying, as we say. It's, yeah. a, little, it's a little funny yes. for me from Oslo. And you guys, you guys go up. 
in your melody, we go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it is. <laughs> so uh, all the mountains, you know, mountains yeah. behind the mountain are really different. Blame the mountains. On the other side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so to really be authentic, I should call you Trills. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's like my mother saying it. Yeah, please don't. But, but I suggest also for the Americans out there that, uh, I mean, they could go, go, they could go for trolls. Trolls, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I think I'll stick with that uh, in this interview. Trolls. Okay. I'd be too confused if I switch over to Norwegian. No, that's fine. Yeah. 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 So, trolls, I have to say the reason I invited you on, it's a twofold reason. Number one. We're starting a new series of media criticism. It's high time. Mm -hmm. Should have done it from the outset, but better late to the party than ever. And I think you're the perfect guest for that because, like I told you before we started here, you're about the only editor. Is that what you call a redacteur in English, editor? Yeah, kind of editor-in-chief, yeah. Editor-in-chief, yeah. You're the only... Yeah, mm. old stream uh, editor that I have a shred of respect for. And the reason being, obviously, that you are the old school type in that you are into investigative journalism and you're also into finding the truth and, and believing in, yeah. um, like, uh, uh, getting um, dissident and censored and marginal. Uh, I mean, you would go for the big story if you stumbled over it. You would not question, you know, money, hmm. uh, control, uh, all that stuff. So so that makes you very valuable. Now, I would say that your paper, which we're going to discuss too, is kind of a weird combination of old school and new media. It has also the fresh new media vibe. Hmm. That you will see in other, in Norway at least, we have other outlets like Reset and uh, Stegon. And I, I feel like you have this, this magical combination of the best of both worlds. So that's why I think you will be a very good guest to discuss uh, these media times with today. Yes, thank you. Okay, so you agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you mean we should discuss this <laughs> as, as friends? No, no. I mean, if you agree, you agree. Yeah. No problem. No, I, I, th- I think the old school is important for me because I am, uh, I'm educated in uh, in uh, philosophy. I have always been uh, the a uh, kind of independent thinker. Or right. in my discussions, I don't have any kind of connections to left, right, or kind of money systems, anything. So I've always been a kind of independent and in respect of this, uh, this few, what do you call it, uh, resistant writers or, or intellectuals around, mm. which is going for truth. So that's the kind of old school that you have this, uh, from the Richard Dreyfus, who was, um, the first kind of encyclopedical intellectual who was trying to, to go for a kind of truth and all the other people around were politically motivated, kind of nepotistic networks, all these kind of mm-hmm. interests that they have together and then the, that forms the opinion they have. And if you are independent, you are kind of more, you're not so pleasant for people because you are not accepting what they want all the time. You are kind of uh, in a kind of resistant fighter because you always kind of ask critical questions. And people mm. get a little tired of that. So my audience is not the kind of majority of people. It's more like the niche of people who wants to think and ask and with questions that's uh, skeptical. Uh, and in a way, that's a, that's the tradition of anarchists in a way, because they are not uh, accepting the, the, the traditional truths. They always want to understand its things themselves. So I'm coming from that kind of Maybe today you can call it a post-anarchist tradition, more mm. pragmatic than the old thing, or social liberal, maybe you can say. Mm. And those people who want to evaluate freedom and solidarity, they always ask questions kind of from an individual, not from the, the group of people. They're always kind of individuals, subjects. So that's the old-fashioned thing. And new media, that's a whole other topic, yeah? Yeah, no, no, that's a very good explanation. I would ask you, if you look at the history of 
a media and, or, or newspapers or whatever we should call it, reporting. Yeah. When would you say was the golden age, not in terms of popularity or, or, or commerciality, money, profitability, but in terms of at what point in history do you think we had the most options, most various voices? I mean, today it's completely monolith. People have no idea. Idea yeah. how monolith it is in terms of what's getting out there, but also, of course, in terms of ownership. And yeah. but when we had like real independent and investigative, and a very because I see many people say, yeah, yeah, you think it's controlled now, but not before. No, that's just because we didn't know about it before. But because of internet, uh, we now we know now it's easier to recognize how controlled and fabricated mm. media is. But it was always like this, and to some extent, of course, that's true. But it's not as true as they think because I'm old enough even to remember the old little older days when it was freer and more range of opinions, even though there were commercial interest and powerful yeah. owners also back then. So so what do you think about this? I mean if you talk about Norway, we have uh, uh, we have we had the political connected newspapers like Often Posten who was the right wing uh, representation. And you had, for example, what you call more a cultural or radical newspaper like Dark Brother. And those two were in a kind of fighting against each other. I think Morn Brother, with the newspaper I bought some 20 years ago or 30 years ago, which was a, uh, was a daily for, uh, was the oldest newspaper in Norway, which I actually bought when it was totally down. Hang on. Are you the guy who bought Morn Brother and uh, restored it to its modern? More yes. intellectual. Wow. Yeah, I did in 1993, and I worked like hell for 10 years to build it up. Huh. It was totally put down, and it, it was coming from a conservative tradition, which was a rep- in a way you can you can you know what kind of opinions was coming from there, like often Post also. Mm. The dog brother was on the other side, and we also had this uh, classic company, which is Glass Struggle. Uh, and Dark Brother is maybe the daily newspaper, you can say. Mm. Often Post, the, the one coming in la- late afternoon. All these four newspapers was uh, very kind of telling what you got. And uh, because of the political uh, parties behind, we also had one called the Workers' Paper, uh, Arbeide Brother. Mm. It was that, uh, so, so it was owned by the different political parties before. But when you ask about this, uh, what you can say, a more free period or kind of golden age on newspapers, I I guess that must have been in the 60s and 70s, last century. Right. Because there was a lot of people who were more radicalized, critical. They wanted to turn the whole paradigm of this bourgeois world we uh, most people live in in the West. Mm. And for peace and love, all these great things. So you can... Uh, I don't think it was more the structure of the paper. It was more the the, the voices of the people who was really engaged. Mm. So that was a great time. And and the new tea, the, the newspaper I own, I own a third of it today. We bought it and we restored it. Some me and some other people uh, six years ago. It it was it 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 is a kind of it has a uh, from 1953. So it's has a long history too. Uh, in the first period, it was called orientating, actually, and, and in that time, there was a lot of very interesting radical and, and authors who was writing there in the 60s and 70s. We just had it, a, it was more a periodical back then. Yeah, it was a weekly and two mm. uh, every second week. Uh, I took it when I took it over. We was trying weekly for a while, but then we didn't have more money to do that. So we turn uh, hang on, I, I want to get back to New Tid. Uh, you, you're going too fast for me here. I want to dwell. Yeah, I, we should keep on the topic. Yeah, yeah I agree. You know, no problem. My prerogative as the host to stare at this, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I want to go back, rewind a little. Okay. So I, I kind of see what you say. Uh, the Watergate time was like the heyday of investigative journalism. But the problem, as I see it, is that today... People have that illusion. It's lingering on as an image. You know, the 
the investigative journalist who fearlessly go where no man has gone before. Yeah, yeah. Of course, in reality, they are just, like I told you, they're stenographs. Is that the English word? You know, you just mm, yeah, yeah. write down what you're told. They are embedded with the troops and bullshit like that. They are st- in, in fact, they don't hire even journalists anymore for TV. They hire news actors, it's better to say. People who look good, who know how to read what's put in front of them. And for the longest time, there was accusation that, uh, especially if we, uh, half my listeners are American, so huh? if we look at America, which is like a, a, a window uh, of <laughs> what's coming to the rest of the world at any given time, <laughs> yeah. I, I think they have like four different owners now, or three different owners of the whole uh, media scene. And there was this, did you see this meme that was around about the one of the news stations where they put a lot of reporters next to each other and everybody was reporting the exact same story. You remember that one? It went like a I mean, that's happening uh, a lot in Norway too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mm. But it was so oversimplified and apparent. I think it was like 30, 40 windows at the end of the clip where they all spend the same story in the same way. It's... Um, this, uh, yeah. oh, I can't remember the name right now, but one of them. And, you know, now we know that it is like that. They get directions from the top, not about absolutely everything, but they do get like notes of what the, they can say or not. And, and we know that from people who have worked in mainstream media and defected. Mm. Yeah, but different people. And so... It is like how people imagine it is. It is utterly controlled and corrupted. And and that would be fine if everybody realized it. But unfortunately, the majority of people are too distracted and busy and tired. And they are grown up with this image that, oh, we can trust uh, repos in the news. They can't imagine that if every newspaper spin the same story in the same way. Yeah then obviously that's the truth and fake news is whatever single independent voice you hear from the internet. Do you have any views on this? Yeah, the, there is many things to comment on this. I mean, mm. uh, you are saying they are they are controlled. I think there is different things going on. I think one thing is that journalists are becoming lazy. Mm. They are well paid. They are go- looking for the dinner and they're going home to play with the children, which is good, but still uh, they don't have this kind of, what you call it, uh, a kind of commitment to life or to, to an occupation, a lot of them. So the lazy ones are out there mm. and they just do things that's the easy way out. For example, in Norway, we had this NTB, this uh, tel- Telegram Bureau, mm. which is Norwegian Telegram Bureau, which is uh, giving out uh, stories to all newspapers. And when I entered the scene back in 1993... Uh, yeah, bought, uh, hang on, it, it, just to explain, it's like Reuters. Like Reuters, yes. And IPP, yeah. And when the, all the newspapers got the Reuters feeds, they were just entering one sentence or two by themselves mm. and putting their own name on. So you can read the same story in every newspaper with different journalists. And they didn't do the job, they just copy-paste, you know. Yeah. So that's that's one thing where you see the, the same story. Another thing is the the war culture, the kind of mentality which is around. Is, is there something happened? Is anyone hurt, or is there anything explosions here and there? And all journalists turn their eyes or face into that thing. So the representativeness of the reality is also very selective. So it's like there is things going on all the time, which is violent, you know, mm. which is not true. So in a way, you get a very biased reality through all these people, because, of course, we know psychologically that people are, uh, the attentiveness for something wrong is, is it five times bigger than something good, you know? So if you are going to sell a newspaper, the wrong things will sell the newspaper. Right. And then you have, for example, Robert Murdoch and these kind of people with the son who was uh, putting down the price uh, in England for a while. And then he, the competition with other newspapers, uh, he was uh, ruling out other competitors. And then 
using some money for a time, when you are a billionaire, you can do that. Mm. And then you put up the price later when all the others are gone. That's another way of what we say, making that view of the sun as the only one or the one or the biggest one or something. Mm. So there is marketing mechanisms also that makes people dumb by this, I will say, kind of stupid journalism you have around more and more in in the last maybe 20 years. Mm. So this is just uh, three or four moments to what you said. You can just keep on asking me. I will <laughs> try no, to no, I agree with that perspective. In fact, uh, the majority of uh, news actors are hired because of their mainstream conventional um, A4, as we say in Norway. I don't know if that translates, but uh, like square headed yeah. yeah yeah if if you want to if i'm uh, one of these uh, billionaires uh, owning a newspaper let's say um, uh, jeff bezos i think he's the one who took over the post or was it washington post yeah yeah hmm. so okay i need uh, a guy i trust to run this ship right so obviously he he uh, uh, would hire one of his from his circle and then that chap you know he can choose between this uh, dissident, critical, uh, who will step on the toes of the powers, or he can choose this uh, slick, uh, vetted mouthpiece. Obviously, he goes for the latter. So yeah. it's also the incentives in the system. And then you have another perspective to explain this. is also that there are journalists who maybe they do care to some extent, but they know that Let's say uh, you see this especially with people who once in a time had some claim to fame and now they're getting a little up in the years and they're resting on the laurels. Mm. They are terrified of losing access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I have access to to the Speaker of the House. I have access to the, this person, that person. But if I'm being too critical, if I'm being too hostile, I will lose access and then I will lose the ability to, you know, get the great story as they think. And so they become self-censoring because of that. Hmm. And add to that also that you said it, you said that uh, news people, it's become an establishment career. So they have high income. In America, they are millionaires, most of the people in the media, and they whine and dine with the other power people, people in the corporations, politicians, etc. And they marry them and, you know, it's, it's their clique. They wouldn't want to be too, yeah. I mean, they want to be nice to their neighbors and their friends and their family, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, I can give you two examples, which sure. is adding to what you say, yeah. Actually, since I've been working a lot with films also, I'm also a film director, documentary, and I've been around in a lot of festivals. Mm. When I was in a Venice festival once, uh, in a press conference, I was asking Ridley Scott about Blade Runner, which he made back in time. So it was a really kind of a eye-opener film about the future, mm. where we were heading. And I respected him for doing that a lot. I asked him if why he was turning into more commercial films and not keeping on that kind of talented intellectual way he was on. Mm. And he, to me and 200 other people, he was actually admitting that he had to earn money. Mm. So he had to do a task that was not freely his own to earn his money. And maybe whining and dining, as you said, but still... He turned away from that kind of when you are younger and more spiritual or maybe more uh, engaged in in the reality and truth. You are mm. doing like things like Blade Runner. And I also asked in the same festival, maybe a year later, Werner Herzog about the same thing because he was doing all these great old films. Mm. He did, and then at that festival he had two two American films. I mean, this German, suddenly he became an American. Yeah. And he was making what I would call more entertainment films with uh, Nicolas Cage and this kind of people. And uh, in a way, they are, but uh, I mean, Werner Herzog is actually still doing some interesting things. Yeah, but, for sure. but that kind of two American films was a kind of turning point for me. That why are you commercialized as an older man? He, he actually married with an American woman, so maybe... 
he was going from a German culture into more Los Angeles culture, but st <laughs> still there is something that to could keep be up it. with your original path, which I'm doing. Yeah, but, but what did he... I didn't quite catch the answer he gave you, uh, Hatsug. No, he was more like nodding. Uh, he was He's not so talkative. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but uh, Ridley Scott was more admitting this thing. Yeah. Right, right, right. So uh, I also asked this, uh, what was his name? I mean, about film is illustrating sometimes. Uh, this uh, guy, Julian Schnabel, who was making the Basqua film mm -hmm. uh, from New York. He, I was asking him when he made this, uh, this Palestinian film why he was using the English as a language between father and daughter, which was Palestinian, and, and there were some Israeli people there speaking uh, Yiddish. Mm. And, he, and then I was asking you, you who made Basca, a real great film about an artist, and you also say that newspapers, he didn't, he didn't like what they called it. The, what's it the, in New York Times, you have this section called art and culture or something. He meant it was so different what was really art and culture or something. Mm. So he was like pretending to be an intellectual. And then I attacked him between the 300 people in the press conference. Why are you then using English for a Palestinian person? And then the, actually the producer was uh, interrupting and say, uh, saying something like, yeah, did you know that Mozart was played in English or something like that? And then this uh, Julian Schnabel said, let me answer this guy. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, I have to earn money. I have to do some compromises because the, fin the finances of films like this cannot be done without having American as language. Uh, but I was trying, they were trying to interrupt me from the moderators. And next question, next question. They didn't want mm -hmm. me to disturb this kind of thing. No. But the, the director was actually admitting the money is taking over. And that's a pity. It is. But that it kind of opens the door for the new media because people nowadays have found a way to crowdsource, so to speak, uh, news outlets. Uh, I'll tell you one of my favorites when it comes to American. I mean, there's different kinds of media, right? Uh, the most prevalent in USA is talking heads, spin doctors, right? Yeah. But they do, that doesn't have to be bad uh, if you can trust them, if they're honest, if you know where they stand. And I, I love Jimmy Dore. He's... Uh, a no-nonsense guy, and it's just like he says himself, he's just a washed-out comedian sitting in his garage reporting. But he can make money from that. And you also see that I mentioned some new media sites here in Norway, and you have, of course, even more in America, which are internet-based. Uh -huh. But I also see some old media efforts to survive that way. I list a few that I have respect for that are... I don't know if you are familiar with them. You probably are. But if you look to America, because America has the worst scene when it comes to media press and media freedom today, I think. Uh, well, there are, of course, dictatures that are worse. But if you compare to modern Western society and so you have the intercept. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which is kind of going their own way. It's great. Yeah. And you have, um, stuff it's like. It's also paid for by this uh, millionaire, you know, billionaire. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually, mm -hmm. uh, controlled by, uh, but you have. Maybe the, not controlled, but, uh, luckily. What's that? Luckily funded. Yeah. Yeah. So who, who is this millionaire behind the intercept, by the way? Was it the guy, was it the same guy who bought the Washington Post or who was it? I, I don't remember actually. Oh my God, Jeff Bezos, wow. No, no, not Jeff Bezos, there was not. Yeah, I don't, actually I don't remember, but they, they got finances from the... Okay, one of the oligarchs. Yeah. But then you have the grey zone, yeah. which is, uh, they call themselves investigative journalism on empire. They mm. have some famous journalists. You have Mint Press News. You have Unlimited Hangout. You have The Last American Vagabond, um, Corbett Report. But more than this, you still have some old school journalists. With that, I don't mean that they are old, but that they are in that tradition. Well, some of them are old. For example, you, we all know John Pilger and Robert Fisk. Robert Fisk. Yeah, they're still going yeah, strong. He's an old school guy. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and John Pilger, of course. Yeah. And then we have, uh, of the new people, we have um, 
Well, Chris Hedges can be said to be of the old guard too. But then you have Glenn Greenwald. Mm. You have Max Blumenthal. Yeah. He's son of an, uh, a famous guy too, but Max Blumenthal is fantastic. And you have Whitney Webb. Just love her stuff. So there are possibilities even in today's media scene. But uh, what do these voices have in common? None of them are working for a mainstream outlet. It's just not, you'll just not get this career of getting rich, famous and well established if you go the real journalism route. So there's still room for it, but it has to be, as I see it, financed by the people. Like many of these outlets are, or journalists even, are doing their stuff being paid directly by, for example, uh, very popular is uh, Patreon or PayPal or, you know, crowdsourcing. Well, there is two, what to say, problematics connected to what you're talking about, I think. Mm. Uh, there is the um, one thing is the money that you're bringing up, up all the time. I think when you have this engagement like Robert Fisk and others have, one thing is the money to survive. In a way, you have to have food on the table. But they would never uh, expose themselves to these risky situations if they didn't have a deep down urge to do something to change the world, being not being an activist, but being a an optimist in there has to be changed. I have to tell people why and, co- and report and report on this kind of war zones uh, like Robert Fisk has been doing. Just now there, uh, there is out on, uh, is it Netflix or HBO? There is this film about Mar- Marie Colvin who was doing the same. She was killed in uh, homes in Syria. What was her name again? Maria Colvin. She was this British uh, reporter. She was in Guardian and other newspapers. She was reporting all the time from Sri Lanka for 15 years or something. She was out in the war zones Mm. and she got uh, killed in the the last one together with her her, um, photographer. He was he actually survived and he has been bringing the story. I actually met this guy in the front club uh, in London where they are focusing a lot on war journalism and all these brave people who's around. And um, and he was telling about how they how they were killed and uh, how, what they were reporting on. So there is a deep down, there is this courage that some people have. So it's not so much about money. In a way, they are getting paid to survive. But uh, me, I've been working with the, my two publications, one just pro bono. Because I think it's so important to do it. Pro bono. Pro bono. I'm mm. not getting paid. Yeah. But I have a little salary on the other one so I can survive. But I'm not, I'm not a rich person at all. I, mm. and I think there is a lot of people out there, like my freelancers also, writing for a very small salary. Mm. And so around there, this money thing, if you are, I think money can control a lot. So if you are not paid, you are, then you, your voice is silenced, some people say, but I think, don't think so. I think, especially now with the internet, mm. we have people talking, saying what's really happening, but there is a jungle of different opinions and different fake news and everything, which we can come back to, but yeah. there is there's actually not the money always, I think. Uh, no, you're right. I'm not doing this for money. I could be really rich if I had been continuing my old job, mm. which was in computer businesses. Okay. Uh, but I never did that. So I think the idealism or the, the courage to do things is something about being human being. Yeah. And the money is the second or the third or fifth thing for a lot of people like us. Mm. Uh, no, I actually forgot the other thing you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, I listed a bunch of uh, journalists I respect, and I also listed a bunch of outlets that are like quality. But it's the same principle, I agree. If people have a passion for the art, for the craft, then uh, that's one thing, but then they need outlets too. And I think internet has been the saving grace of media because... Uh, it has given, uh, you know, I never, this meme that you often hear, oh, you're, you're listening to YouTube. Oh, this is a YouTube news. Mm. It's so elitist and irrational, actually, because YouTube is a platform. 
<laughs> it's not like, you know, in the old days you could say, you remember these wacko newspapers? I forgot what they were called, all of them, but they would have like Bigfoot uh, married uh, the hairy lady or something on the front page, right? <laughs> so they are talking about YouTube as if it's something. No, YouTube is, new, well, not neutral anymore, but it used to be a neutral platform, yeah. like a podcast platform, right? And it all depends on the contents. And anyway... We see now how the geriatric old stream media is planning to survive. And I, I can boost that I w was onto this from the very beginning before many people saw this. Okay. Yeah. I was saying, look, here's, here's the plan. Alphabet taking over Google, taking over YouTube and owned by the same powers that owns the old media houses. Now they see and they've seen for a while how old stream media is, is tanking, is crashing. Uh, an average Fox or CNN viewer is around 75 years old. And so they see this old stream media is dying. Young people, they're not watching television. They're not reading papers. Like, hmm. like uh, one of my guests said to me, his daughter, if he mentioned Washington Post or New York Times, it, you know, for his generation, it is with awe in their voice, right? But for his daughter, that's just a website. <laughs> it's just a new URL, an yeah, address, yeah. right? <laughs> so, and oh, I love it because uh, with, with this paradigm shift also comes a shift of the overtone window. We'll get back to that. But the point being that, yeah, what was the point? I talked myself away. Um, where was I going with this? I, I, th I mean, that, that all the old newspaper, made of paper things is, is vanishing in a way because internet yeah, is taking thank over. You. Yeah. So, yeah, so what they're doing, their plan has been all the way. They were watching this uh, development with uh, worry. And you, you, you've been aware of this for a long time. I've read about it in uh, Norwegian press for decades, actually, how internet is taking over. Now, what they did, they were observing the internet and they were assessing which platform is the most popular? And they determined that's YouTube. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll take over YouTube and it will become like a nursing home for the old stream media. <laughs> and that's exactly what they've done. You'll find every mainstream channel now on YouTube and they are investing more and more in it. And as they took over, they realized, Scheiße, it's not enough to just own the platform because... You know, YouTube was breaking through by giving you and me a voice. YouTube, right? So mm. they already had an established uh, whole host of channels, which were uh, grassroots. So th th they want the viewers, but they don't want the independent mu media that already was on YouTube. So they had to concoct strategies to get rid of uh, the old media. Uh, not all, but <laughs> all on YouTube. So... That's how they started the, all the scandals that has come the last years, like uh, YouTube Gate, uh, okay. all these uh, things where they reveal that they're shadow banning stuff, developing algorithm to keep back independent stuff and facilitate mainstream stuff. They're basically uh, removing ads. For example, if you're an independent contributor, and you mention the word Syria, just an example, hmm. you'll automatically be demonetized. Hmm. If you're CNN, MSNBC, Fox, no problem at all. Stuff like that. And now they go even further with the censoring, and we'll get back to that as a subject too. So now they remove videos. Like I have a video with a Nazi in the title. I was interviewing a renowned scholar about historic themes. Uh, one of them was... Uh, People connected to the JFK case that were Nazis. So it has nothing to do with World War II, nothing to do with Germany, nothing to do with gas chambers and stuff like that. But, oh, buzzword Nazi, bam, remove it. So now they're downright censoring stuff too. Yeah, yeah. And this has been their plan. Then it's beyond money interest because we can, in, in, in a capitalist system, you know, in a classical capitalist system where you get incentives for payment and where people can contribute too. So it's not just the oligarchs paying. In that system, you can discuss how fair it is, but at least you have an opportunity to get through. In a system where stuff is controlled, and I'm not talking CIA type of control, we can get back to that too, yeah. mm. but I'm talking like China controlled. 
or for that matter, old Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany, that kind of control is, is now coming more and more. And it's not the state, nation state who controls it per se, it's the corporations. The multinational globalist corporations. You, you can of course argue that today it's the same as a national state because it's, it's the same interest. America especially is hijacked by these interests after they legalized bribes in the political system. So you could discuss, of course, how much it's actually nation state or not, but it's those oligarchical interests. Mm. And, and then the, the playing field isn't fair anymore because we could crush the old three media if we were giving a fair chance. But they, they're not interested in giving a fair chance to independent media. It's not like they are <laughs> in this to, you know, for principles or anything. It's all about raw power. Any comments to that perspective? Yeah, I, uh, two, two comments. I think, uh, um, I mean, I also have the uh, another friends in the colleagues there talking about. I just put out an ad on uh, on one of our articles, and I mentioned Snowden and Assange in the text, and uh, it was uh, denied just because a very three sentences and Snowden and Assange was enough. So it was. Hang on, hang on. Where was this? Who denied this? Yeah, on Facebook. Sorry, it was on Facebook. Ah, Facebook. Yes. So <laughs> that's uh, saying a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, the um, monetizing thing that all these corporations is putting up as the highest value, and then they have this kind of facade which is pretending to be some, uh, to be uh, doing something for enlightenment that people uh, want information, mm. but uh, they are mostly there for the shareholders. So, in the in the board meetings, they are talking about what's the profit, you know. So when that's the highest goal. And not uh, some of the old families in the old, old media was actually saying, just keep on, don't lose the money. Mm. Just keep on and keep the values high. So that has changed into this profit-driven thing, not value-driven, but uh, money value, you can say, has, mm. has been taking over. So that's why they are maybe uh, selecting out more complicated stuff. I guess it's also other things, not only political things, I think, if there is an article which is a little too complicated about something about nature or ecology or something, it can also be uh, falling down in the algorithm because they want to, they want to, to what you say, make uh, favor, make favorites on the um, entertainment things, so, uh, feelings uh, like they did on Facebook. That just was premiering the family val- family values or or these kind of nice things if you say love for example or something mm. or my puppy then you are high up in the algorithm so in a way they are trying to get traffic they're going to a lot of viewers and they're going to sell the viewers to the advertisers so that's the whole model for mm. it's maybe not so very much about uh, uh, what to say uh, criticism that's uh, bad it's more like it's bad for the profit Mm. It's not, maybe they will say, yes, he's right, that was the real story, but we don't care. I'm here for the profit. So the money, money talks. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm, ge- I'm forgetting my second point. We are, we are so eager at talking, so. <laughs> So that's how it is, Al. I'm uh, losing some time. You should take notes, man. <laughs> I admit it. I'm taking notes all the time just so I can get around to my points. Yeah, yeah. I should start doing that. Aren't you the, you're the journalist here. You should be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, if it comes to you, tell me. I want to I wanna switch over to you again because this is going to be a segue to something related to what we just discussed. Yeah, no, no oh. I remember, remember the... Okay. Um, yeah. I think when you were talking about the... Um, the audience out there who is not getting the information because of the controlled media by these oligarchs or whoever wants the media. I think also the blame is to put on the people also. People don't care. A lot of people, they are saying, I'm tired, I've been working, I like to be entertained. Yeah. Don't give me too complicated stuff. So I, I actually don't believe in the because I think they are not interested at all. So that's actually a problem with democracy also, mm. that if you don't have an enlightened discussion, and then you don't have a real democracy. And if you ask people around, why are you not reading the good newspaper or something or the, the critical stuff? They say, I don't have the, 
the resources. I, I'm, I'm tired. I have to get an entertainment film tonight. I'm not reading your paper because that's too complicated for me. Mm. And they have other things they want to do. They want to run around in nature or take or play with the children. Yeah, so, now you're talking about Norwegians. Oh, yeah, maybe. Maybe Norwegians are <laughs> better in Norway. Uh, especially nature and children, yeah. Yeah, but I think a lot of people, they, they, that's why maybe we have a parliamentary system. Also, they are saying, you should find out. I'm just living. I, yeah. So the readers, you are expecting to find out things like I'm doing in the old-fashioned way or Robert Fisk is doing from Syria. Mm. A lot of people, they don't care. They don't want to use their time on this. So this expectation that uh, if you just buy YouTube or something for the old-fashioned news, that will not help. No, I agree. I am not so optimistic about this. Typical um, corporate uh, thought, oh, we'll just take over YouTube and we'll become popular. People are defecting big time from YouTube now. Okay. But the, mm. of course, they have another advantage, and that's that you can't just put up. People are saying, oh, let the market decide, let another channel just rise up. It's not that easy because those who would have the money to facilitate a huge uh, project like a YouTube mm. are the same people who are not interested in competition with their platform. So it's like those few challenges that's out there. Uh, there's two problems. One is that those who could afford it won't do it because we are long past the time of the rich uh, innovator or like the eccentric billionaire. Now they all have a certain interests. But the other problem is also that those who try to set up a competition to YouTube, they're making a monumental mistake. And that's sectarianism. It's one of the keys to YouTube success is that they were neutral. And they were facilitating a platform for all and everyone. That has to be it. Mm. Uh, the same with Facebook. It was like a blueprint of society. When you set up a system that's appealing to a segment, let's say all the alt writers go here, all the new agers go here, all the, you know, there's so many segments people can be divided into. And if they're all going to get each their platform, none of them will succeed. Then you'll still have the huge a monument that is YouTube and you have a fragmented landscape around it nibbling at their ankles at best yeah. so so that's another problem but you're right we live in the time of infotainment but you could argue that yeah blame the people but then again look at the culture what's influencing the culture in some countries not necessarily ours but in most countries People don't even have living wages. They have to take two and three jobs to make uh, things go around. They're dumbed down by the educational system and the media system. Yeah. So it's like a vicious circle. It's like an organic thing where you kind of, you're born into it and you have to be, really be above the fray, uh, like in her, uh, inborn, <laughs> more of a genius than your average to even understand this and have the craving for something deeper that your average human being isn't stimulated in today's world to be the best and the brightest. I believe hmm. we could have a system globally or locally, whatever, where people were stimulated to be the best that they can be. Unlike today, where you are rewarded if you are the worst you can be. I know this sounds very dystopian uh, and pessimistic, and I'm not saying it's 100% like this, but there is an argument to be made for that the whole system is rigged in a way so that you get what you expect. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I think I think it's this is complicated because you can say, is it the hen or the egg? Yeah, what exactly. comes first? Is, yeah. is, uh, if you look into the psycho psychology of a human being, are they in, in the bottom, in the ground? Are they more egoistic? And you have to cultivate that into a more altruistic way of being. I mean, if you look today at the Norway or the West, you can say maybe we all should give away 30% over, over living conditions to, to feed the rest of the 800 million out there who is going to bed every evening hungry. 30%, that will help out. Then we will have equality or at least a minimum. So everyone has the, the basic needs. Do you think the 30% uh, what you say, lowering of your your resources will be accepted by 
all these people in the West? No. Are they too egoistic to accept that? And are these poor people too far away so they don't care? I mean, this is difficult to say that you can just stimulate uh, people to be good. Yeah, but you um, don't just throw money. I mean, look at uh, the school system. We have the Waldorf schools, Steiner schools. They're really stimulating pupils to be good. Yeah, that's for a few people. Sure, sure. But it's coming from special families sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, but the, the, the principle is, it's not about money. It's not that if we just double the school money, then that will happen, right? No. So it, it's just as much about the contents of the culture as the money interests, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I, this I've been thinking a lot about this kind of egoistic thing. I mean, if you want to look to an action film on Netflix, mm. or if you want to read a very interesting thing on Syria by Intercept, which is enlightening you, and you can talk with other people. This is not right. The Norwegian government is now sending troops to the, the desert to fight down there. Why are we doing this kind of war cultural thing? Mm. And you're protesting. That's a kind of outcome of maybe reading some very old-fashioned newspaper things like Intercept. Mm. But instead of that, a lot of my friends is saying, now I want to see this action film. I don't care. Mm. We sometimes we discuss this when we have a beer or something in a cafe, mm-hmm. but most of the time I'm, I just want some ice cream and Netflix. Mm. So this this uh, this psychological depth of a human being. Do you really think the whole globe of seven billion people will be stimulated to a kind of equal world? I'm not so sure about this uh, this idea of, of that we can just be enlightened. But I actually like some of this organizations like we had the United Nations and European Union, that this kind of structures maybe should have a kind of what you call it a qualified uh, majority, like 67 percent, and they can decide on long term issues like ecology and different things. And yeah, okay, so you mean like a, like a, um, scientists or experts running the system? Experts, people with expertise, with experience, wise people, uh, people who have uh, experienced different situations, so they know this kind of a group that can be our, uh, what to say, advisors and and some some assemblies that can decide. Instead of these nations, I mean, yeah, Norway, yeah. for example, is a very egoistic nation. Do you think the interests of Norway will be for the common world out there? I mm. don't think so. I no. think we like to have the money up here, you know. Yeah, uh, rule by enlightenment. I mean, yeah, here's the philosopher in you coming out, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said I've been thinking a lot about this here. Yeah, yeah this <laughs> goes back to Plato and whatnot. But here's the thing. Yes, it could work if we started from scratch. It could never work in today's society. Man. Too late, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an, I'll give a metaphor. Okay. You have this idea about fact checkers. Oh, a noble idea. Let's try to tidy up the mess, the jungle out there. First off, I've never been afraid of too many voices. I, I, I'd rather have a world with a million voices than a world with two voices, to put it like that. And another thing, I don't think equality is the highest goal either. That won't solve anything. Equal opportunities, sure, but not like an artificial equality. But let's go back to the fact checker. So you have the old uh, adage, who's watching the watchers? Who's fact checking the fact checkers? That This has become a huge problem because one after another, they are busted and revealed and debunked as propaganda outlets, basically. Mm, yeah. Even site like Wikipedia. Sure, if you want to know the capital of Botswana, go to Wikipedia. If you want to know what year Tom Hanks married, go to Wikipedia. If you want to know Anything controversial, even at a minor field that you wouldn't even imagine could uh, stir up emotions like uh, which school in butterfly studies is more right about the coloring. <laughs> you'll, you'll see vested interests, you'll see mm. strong emotions and you'll see the, you see you're old enough to remember in the 70s in Norway, we had um, the communists uh, and Kope. No, no uh, not Ankope, uh, Akope. Akope um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were always, they were a relatively small group in terms of popular support. They were never like anywhere close, uh, let alone majority, but even a big party. But even at their heyday, they had a control as if they were one of the big parties. Why? 
because their genius way of organizing, they had li- this collective bully, <laughs> bully kind of activism. Yeah. Because if, if 20 people attack one person, they win. Then they uh, move on and attack another person and they win. And eventually they can attack a thousand people, just being 20 people, but they win. And that's how Wikipedia is organized. In addition, of course, Wikipedia is compromised by money interests and Intel interests. So at the end of the day, if we had like wise, enlightened people in our society, if it was going to be implemented today, it would be the powers that be who initiated it, and it would be corrupt from the outset. Like most of those changes from the top today are just window dressing. Mm. There are changes going on, by all means, but they are always coming from the grassroots, and they are organic, and they take time. I'll give you an example. Okay. Today, in the Western countries, homosexual marriage is like no big deal among most people. At least a majority think so. It was never decided politically. There was never a moment in history where all the politicians went to the parliament and, okay, now, bam, we're going to change this. No, it's the culture changes and then legislators and law follows after. And so I I do believe in positive change, but I'm hard pressed to see how a handful of elitists can implement that. We 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 kind of straying away from the topic, but uh, you see what I'm saying. It's important. It's very important to talk about because yeah, it is. You know the Marxist idea of the base, the base uh, and the superstructure. Yeah. Which you mentioned, like the culture now, mm. economy and culture. I think culture comes first. Mm. And so we can say it's not the superstructure; it's not added on. I think it's the the ground under the base. Yeah. In a way, you can say if there is a meaning that uh, that homosexuals are okay, they, they are friendly, they are always gay. You know, we like these people, and suddenly this marriage comes up, and there is legal and economical things coming that starts in the culture. Yeah. Just one example, I think. And I think also this profit idea that you always have to accumulate things. That's a cultural. That's an ideology. It's a cultural thing. Mm. And then comes this all these systems for tax paying and and profit and uh, investment and finance is coming after. Yeah. So if we go into the how meaning is established, how practices are established, it's a very interesting thing which I've been doing from in my newspapers for 25 years. Always mm. look, looking into the. It's not philosophy. It's more like culture or or currents uh, yeah. that we have for meaning at all. The re- our reality is based on interpretations all the time. Some are more strong and more rigid and others is shifting. And then comes all the legal and economical frameworks after. Mm. In a way, the material base, the material things is coming after how we make these structures, you know. It, mm. And it's evolving from over a long time, some of them. And now a lot of things is coming much faster. So there's a lot of changes going on also. But still this power thing, if you go back to this uh, elite you talk about, uh, it's interesting that you say that you cannot establish that today, uh, this expert panel or something. I think um, there is something about the, um, if you are, if you see some honest people, uh, who's, who's going to choose them and not the rich guy exactly. to, to be in this elite? Yes. I think, for example, in the left in Norway, we have a lot of people always saying they're elite. We hate them. I was also called uh, the elite once when uh, I was starting my last newspaper, the, the third one I established. And it was, uh, I was painted in Klasse Kampen as, uh, was it Marie Antoinette, like give them cakes or something like that. So they were making me as a ridiculous figure because I was. You, talk- you were compared to Marie Antoinette? Yeah, like <laughs> like I was the, the elitist, you know, who was uh, very dangerous oh, okay. and I didn't care for the people, etc., etc. Right, Just right, because right. I was talking about meritocracy, yeah. the merits, that people with merits, which I was not uh, talking about, I wasn't talking about money, but every time we are talking about something who sounds like elitist, it's about money. Hmm. How much do I get? You know, this kind of thinking. I was actually talking about the merits, the leaders that should be there, 
that should never be be inherited like your the king your father and then you get the prince you know yeah plutocracy that's not the right thing yeah, to do yeah. so i was talking about merits like people with abilities with the experience with knowledge and with a good heart on the right side usually that should be on the left you know but uh, still people with good emotions with experience and and uh, those should be in this kind of elite that we decide for long term goals and also for the ecology yeah but this is a classical problem uh, this has been discussed since the dawn of mankind how to put those people it's in power it's very difficult if you if you ask the majority they don't care for this they want the popular guy you know they want the the, the handsome uh, or the guy who is actually lying to them yeah they believe they want to believe them instead of using their mind a little to find out the the honest or the knowledgeable person they don't choose them they don't choose my newspaper either because it's a little too complicated for people and things like that yeah but i don't think enough people are aware of your newspapers i, I think that's a bottom yeah, line that that's a big point but still i'm i'm insisting on this they don't care they won't yeah. care if you saw me either a lot of those people. No, you'll ne- you'll never compete with the the, the tabloid press like VG and Dagblad or mass media. No, I, no, I'm not. But you have enormous potential for growth. And I'm going to segue over to your newspaper. But I just want to say one thing about this point, and that's that. Imagine that we were like a hundred people um, traveling to Mars. We were s- selected for this uh, groundbreaking astronaut trip. Okay. And we were going to establish the first colony there. Mm. If we got disconnected from Earth somehow, I imagine in such a scenario, it could be possible with a metocracy. Because it's small enough for people to, you know, know who is good at different things. Yeah. Mm. And so it would be in everyone's interest to put the best person in charge because they would feel it on their body immediately. If you have someone who has no clue about the oxygen tank or growing the plants, <laughs> it's the death, right, of all of it's us. It's the death, for, yeah, or the doctor who doesn't know. So, it. Yeah, so we'd be forced. Yeah. yeah, and this is like an anarchic principle because you keep yeah. it small, you keep it yeah, yeah. autonomous, and you keep it decentralized. That could work. Mm. But in today's globalism, oh man, oh man. But let's go over to your newspaper, New Teed, or in English, New Time. Yeah, uh, Modern Time. Yeah, there's a segue here that's relevant to something we discussed not long ago. Because actually you said that you've only run it for six years, but it has to be more. Because I remember you got in big trouble when you were publishing a series on 9-11. And that was like a wake-up call. Uh, for everyone who was o- observing this. Oh, wait a minute, that wasn't New Time, that was Morgenblad, wasn't it? No, no, it was in 2017, three years ago. You sure it wasn't? Because you had some, uh, you also had some uh, conferences. Yeah, actually, you're right. The, we did something back in 2006 in the Le Monde Diplomatique when I was running that for 10 years. That's it. Yes. That was discussions around false flag, etc. And I brought it back in 2017 with a lot of reactions. Can you guide us through that experience, uh, both in oh, 6 yeah. <laughs> and in 17? Because I, I think this yeah. says everything. People need to hear this. Yeah, okay. I will try. It's a long time ago. Uh, we, uh, we were very kind of skeptical to the explanations that came out. Uh, back in 2006, when I was running Le Monde Diplomatique here in Scandinavia, I got a journalist to dig into this kind of investigative journalism. And he found out a lot of things in three articles, a series through the summer of 2006, I think. It was about uh, kind of suspicious things going on in America, like the FBI, for example, they were... A local unit was saying we want to go to the Florida schools because there is something there, which is strange, but some Arabic thing. And, and they were denied it three times from the central FBI to mm. go in dig into that. And that has been talked about a little. Mm. That was one thing. The other thing was the third tower, World Trade Center 7, which was um, not talked about for most people. So then we had a... Uh, a conference on this uh, or a debate in Oslo with 300 people with, with one from the national television etc uh, 
very few of those people actually know that there was a third tower. So this kind of how how informed are really people? There? And we were discussing then this kind of uh, the demolition theory, for example, that mm. uh, the towers were taken down. It was not. I mean, there's there was this. Uh, I'm not sure if that came up later. I think this architects and engineers for uh, 9/11 Truth, that organization is maybe developed later, but. This, uh, this, uh, criticism from the experts about this is not possible because the 9-11, the, the two, the two towers that fall down was built for resisting a Boeing 747, something like that. Mm. So it shouldn't have fallen down. And then, so we in, uh, but late, so we were discussing this, uh, these suspicious things back then. And there was some discussions in Norway, uh, and uh, there was people shouting and screaming in the audience <laughs> against this national TV. Mm. That uh, didn't you know? Why don't we get informed on national television about this and <laughs> things like that? Mm. So we actually recorded that uh, session. Maybe. I think it's somewhere out there on YouTube. Um, but this was in Norwegian. Uh, but uh, later on, that was the maybe main uh, su- surprise that when we were doing this with the, the, I think it was the information director of this organization, of 3,000 people back there in in the states, who was critical about the, the N- NIST architects uh, and engineers re- for 9/11 Truth or something. Right, that group. We mm. got Ted Walters to write a big essay about this for us. Mm. He was very competent on, on writing. So this NISTA report, the official one, was actually looked more like a conspiracy theory. That uh, it's called a whitewash. Same with the JFK uh, commission yeah. report. Yeah, uh, we were actually we didn't find the right information. There was so much omitted in that report, etc. Mm. So we brought to the to the to the knowledge of the readers this. Uh, several points that was uh, really important to know why these towers uh, uh, why they could have fallen down just because of the gasoline of the two airplanes mm. so one of the points was this uh, steel doesn't melt from uh, something like 1150 degrees celsius it's uh, not enough it has to be 1350 or something mm. So this shouldn't have been falling down like, and also, for example, aluminium that was melted uh, is not showing this uh, this yellow things coming out. It, it is white, and this tens of these seconds, ten seconds of what it was that it fall down, it cannot fall that fast mm. without some explosives inside. So and and it shouldn't fall directly down. It should have been falling. On the sides and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the most suspicious thing was the third tower that was not hit. So I mean, every journalist, with a respect for his own honesty, should say, "Here is so much sus- suspicions about this thing, thing happening." So uh, that was motivating me to put some efforts into this, and we published this in 2017, just three years ago. And the, the big reaction came up here in Norway, which I never had expected. Mm. We were actually, Nitid, uh, my newspaper was uh, inserted in the daily newspaper called Class Company, Class Struggle. And I got a phone from the, from the, the editor and a mail from the director that this is not real journalism. And I was thinking, <laughs> what? We were actually, like I was ta- telling you, that we had actually six, seven points that was suspicious. We were bringing them up. Mm. Think yourself, you know. Mm. Like in a more essayistic style of, of journalism, because we were monthly, we were not doing news. Mm. And we, I was attacked from so many parts here in Norway, like 3,000 comments was amazing. on Facebook. Yeah, They were telling me that I was an idiot, and all the people say, I'm not like this extreme conspiracy theorist like Charles Lee. So, so uh, I was... Uh, that is very hard, you know. But but it wasn't just it wasn't just the commenters. By the way, many of them are sure. Some of them are fragile. You know, they can't handle the paradigm being challenged. They need to cling to some semblance of yeah. trust and security. But many of them are actually uh, dirty operators, trolls, uh, paid actors. We know that now. There's lots of revelation. But 
I'm more concerned with how the, uh, well, I wouldn't say establishment, but, you know, like serious voices out there, you know, colleagues and, and mm, mm. people who are supposed to, politicians, all sorts of voices that has some impact. Everyone was colluding against you and just, and of course the attacks were, as you can expect, completely off topic, ad hominem, nonsensical, smears. Yeah. It was just a horror show. <laughs> yeah. So you're asking me to tell more? <laughs> well, uh, it's interesting <laughs> to hear your perspective. Of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. One question about that. Was that a wake up call for you? I mean, not a complete wake up call, but surely even you must have been shocked yeah in a way i it was a kind of realistic uh, thing i mean there was like this literary professor in bergen who was uh, I, th- I felt he was really interesting guy he was telling me to go out and give a total excuse for what i have done to to apologize right to save the left of norway the left <laughs> the, the public left of newspapers right i got uh, i got other people i really respect who were saying you should withdraw from your position yeah and and there was uh, a lot of people who were saying uh, i haven't said dirty things uh, about how i was hmm. and uh which I, I, I wouldn't uh, expect this to happen because there was this uh, horde of people who was just following each other. They didn't read the article because they were not arguing. They were just, like you said, ad hominem. Mm. They were taking the person and not the case. They didn't discuss the case. The article was never discussed in a way. Mm. I was brought into the Norwegian radio and I was telling them, okay, I can I can be there in the radio show. But then you have to have an interesting person, not the one you are suggesting. And they say, yes, yes, we are going to have an interesting discussion about this. Mm. We'll find another person. Okay, I said, I will do. And they were just mocking me all the time with another person who was just making fun of me. Mm. So they they have decided already that I was an idiot. Mm. And this newspaper I told you about, which was actually a, a very important contribution economically for us, uh, because we were getting money to be inserted to something like 25,000 people who was getting needed mm. when we were in there for 30 years or something. Uh, every month, they were attacking me on the editorial page. The Björgul Bron, the yeah, I remember. Edit- editor, was actually writing that I was saying this was an inside job. And, and it was an extreme conspiracy theory. He was defining what I did, which was totally out of context and a lot of people just believed what he wrote there and then they were starting to point me at me and saying you are like that mm. i was never saying in in these articles in need that this was an inside job done by the americans which is really hard to say you know who it was no, that's a conclusion you you were asking questions yeah, concluding i was saying it i didn't do that no and and uh, so that was very interesting and then this newspaper throwed us out. They said, you should not be in our newspaper anymore. So they throwed out new team, which we were we were losing something like 150,000 euro mm. on this. To, of course, we lost a lot of uh, subscribers too. Mm. So th- so this uh, some of this you call dirty people who is getting paid. I don't know so much about who is paying who, but I, I'm sure this is happening around. So they were believed. And you know, when you put out the rumors of somebody, it sticks to you. Yeah. So when you, when I, I became this uh, leprosy guy, people were just uh, back, backing and said, don't touch this guy. Mm. Of course, you are going to get the infection too, you know. So I was standing there alone after that happened, yeah. Didn't you get also some new uh, people signing on? Because Yeah, they... we got support from some people who said we were, had a lot of courage doing this. Mm. Uh, and there was a book written. Uh, some uh, thing sometime later, so there is some some people around which I call more like this anarchist attitude that you you don't believe what you are told. You have to find out yourself. Mm. Those people is still with us, mm. uh, but, but that's uh, still a kind of few few people in the public of Norway. Of course, most people like to be entertained, and they like to do this new thing that's all around now, which is this emotional public. That if somebody is hurt or something, everybody's look, are you hurt or 
is somebody saying something bad to some person. That's the whole thing. It's not about the real conditions of the reality mm. mostly anymore. So when emotions and this, uh, I mean, me too is a, is a good thing, but it can also be too much, you know, oh, yeah. that everyone who is insulted is screaming and then you cannot see what's happening anymore because everyone on this, I mean, national TV, just look at the internet site. It's just emotions all the time. Yeah. Who is insulting who? Who doesn't like what? So mm. the likes and dislikes is taking over. Identity politics, big distraction. And uh, it is a distraction. That's right. Yeah. And um, but but your experience here is a case for the control angle because I'll be honest. Whatever his name is, Björnulf, classic company editor. Björnulf Brown. Yeah. Classical example of a gatekeeper. He's not an honest actor at all. I mean. Sure, you can say something that people have emotional reactions to. You can do that, and that's fair. You can have disagreements, etc. But anyone pretending to be a power-critical journalistic outlet will at least glance at the contents before they go into full outrageous mode. Yeah, yeah. This just re- reveals that the whole... Uh, because sites... Or papers like Klassikampa, which is a traditional left uh, power critical. You have power critical all across the board, left, right, but this is a left one. And already back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, the CIA realized that they have to, they can't just collect intel and give it to their leaders. They also have to shape opinions. They have to take their spin and inject it into the masses. And so they launched something called Operation Mockingbird, which is still going on today, by the way. Yeah. And there's a revelation and admission. So, yeah, we have to control the press. In the beginning, it was the primitive way, you know, back in the Cold War day. Like you, you either threaten journalists or you pay journalists or somehow you compromise them or you blackmail them. They don't have to do that anymore. First off, in the mainstream media in America today, they are downright hiring so-called, you know, hilarious word, intel community, as if it's like a organic group of people. But they are hired ex-NSA, uh, ex-CIA, and just putting them all over the place openly. Admit it, it's on the, it's on the CV. <laughs> They're not even hiding it anymore. And second to that, it's also like a competition of which journalist can get the graces of the intel communities or... Like I said, dine and wine, and yeah. yes, you have also direct uh, payments. So they've controlled the old stream press for so long, and now comes internet, and they are shocked and threatened because it's very hard to control such a thing as internet. They're doing their best, and they're doing hell of a good job of it. Uh, and, and, and of course, through platforms like YouTube, etc. But internet is the new battlefield over opinion. Mm. And the reason you we're faring so hard in my analysis is that, you, I mean, if you were just an opinion, uh, an internet opinion thing, it wouldn't be that bad, big of a deal. But you were reaching the people who are defining the overtone window. You were reaching old people, which read the paper press. You were reaching the establishment, which even if Closer Company is such an out there, you know, very polarized kind of outlet it's still at least in Norway everybody's reading all the big papers just to know what's going on right so you're reaching yeah. far beyond people who just identify with the ideology of that paper yeah. and you're giving like credibility that's the problem you're giving credibility to real questioning you can't have that put it in the sewer as they see it that is the internet but such a thing coming through the traditional media Oh my God, can't have that. Mm. And that's also why you've seen traditional outlets, which are power critical, like Der Spiegel, The Guardian, uh, The Independent, Le Monde. I mean, the real Le Monde, not the one you were running in Scandinavia, but the original one in France. All these classical outlets, and in America, New York Times, Washington Post, People still have this image that these are system critical, these are trustworthy. But the real fact of the matter, as I see it, is that they've become institutions, geriatric institutions, and they've become compromised long ago. 
corrupted and yeah they can have some interesting original article about something that's not too serious but if you really challenge the overtone window bam that's when the hammer comes down on you yep. and mm. 9-11 is one such like they say a uh, canary in the mine case but there's another one I want your input on Okay, and that's, and that's a song. song. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Wikileaks Assange has become a new example of you know, a symbolic thing, like if someone is reporting fairly and in depth on that, you know you can trust them. The alternative is either they're not reporting on it at all, or they're spinning it to try to whip up hatred against, in this case, Snowden, Assange, stuff like that. Same with 9-11. Comment? Yeah, you know, I actually asked uh, the foreign minister of uh, Sweden about Assange uh, half a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Margot Wallström, she she's not she she was it for many years she uh, she's retired now but uh, she didn't want to uh, to answer that she she was the one who was actually talking about the Palestine and and uh, Saudi Arabia as a middle age thing so she got a lot of criticism for that but when I was trying to get her a comment I mean Sweden has really been uh, bad in the Assange cage about this kind of this kind of rape stories that uh, is this this uh, rumors that's out there, you know. That's the bump. So so I asked her directly about this, and she didn't want to comment. Mm. She was afraid about this. So that's interesting. This was on the record, right? Yeah, I have it on record. Yeah, yeah but I mean, uh, when you asked her, it wasn't like a private chat. No, it, this was an interview for yeah. my for New Tid, my newspaper. Okay. So she didn't want to, to go into that. She <laughs> said it's complicated or something like. And and if you if you want these powerful people up there, you know, she was actually the candidate to be the prime minister in Sweden also, mm. or she was the next one to the top, the, the assistant or what you call it, the deputy. Mm. So so when you when you talk with people high up, they are very scared about these kind of cases because th- this is the big nepotistic network of whining and dining and all these people. And if you are a little outside, critical. You can get, uh, you can fall out, you know. Right. But uh, to, there's a lot of things to comment on Assange. I mean, I think uh, this sexual thing, it's also bad to see how the big audience out there is running after this kind of juicy stuff, you know. So it's so easy for CIA or who is behind this kind of rumoring, putting out the rumors and and uh, and ac- accusations to to get people to believe in these things you know if you say a guy is pedophile it's very hard for him mm. maybe he's very friendly with, with children to get away from that kind of description i mean totally innocent but people is looking at you as you are a pedophile you know mm. so this this psychology of people out there is helping all these powerful people to do their kind of tricky stuff you know Mm. So that's the one side of it. I mean, this courage that uh, Julian Assange has shown us by going out so massively with information, which is, has been selected. So he's not kind of putting people out, I mean, soldiers or whatever, in very dangerous situations. But he's taking down all these powerful people by showing them from this kind of inside kind of telegrams or whatever they have been sending around. So, showing the video, which I actually showed in my in Le Mans Diplomatique when I was running this Scandinavian edition. You should know that Le Mans Diplomatique is around in 25 different editions around the world as a kind wow. of very independent, uh, owned by, 50% is owned by Le Mans and the rest is by the owners and the and uh, not by the shareholders. And uh, so, the, so you you <laughs> would you would assert that Le Mans is not compromised. I'm saying that Le Mans Diplomatique. The, it's a self-owned company, owned 50% by Le Monde. 
is is very independent, owned by the subscribers and and some shareholders, mm. and then Le Monde. But I did, I did it for ten years, and all the stuff we were doing there is very really, very independent, very critical. Mm. So, um, but I th- I think the um, the Assange case case is uh, showing how when you are really honest, showing power how power is. Then suddenly we have this you now the, the the court case, the way that powers is is using their power to just silence this kind of voices that I and other people stands for mm. by going after person on the whole globe. You know, if you are not in America, suddenly you are accused in another country from America, mm. and how this. People now is I'm sure they are going to send him in January when the when this uh, verdict is coming. If he's not dying before this before yeah. Christmas, he's very sick. You know, yeah. how can one person stand up against so much power? Mm. And this is my my point when I'm writing about this now and then is that this is delegitimizing the the courts, the, the governments that's jumping into this. I think a lot they are losing respect in so many circles. By doing this, because it's so obvious that this is not about uh, what they are criticized for. They just want to silence the messenger. This is ad hominem at this worst case. They're taking the guy who is saying truth. Yeah, more than that, I think it's uh, making an example. They want people. Uh, that's why uh, they do it in a way that everybody can see what's going on. They want us, everyone, to know that if you ever try to stand up against the real total power. This is what's going to happen to you. You know, they have put him in this cage, in this kangaroo court, in this cage. Yeah. And I read that it's only of other people who have been put in cages like that on display. It's only been like mass murderer, serial killers and stuff like that. <laughs> and also... Yeah, were- this is government, is government propaganda. Yeah. They're making, aestheticizing this like... Look at this uh, this uh, monster guy who is guilty, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and I read that. Um, what was the last Nazi who got a trial in in um, Israel? What was his name again? Um, yeah, you mean the um, yeah, what's his name again? They took Eichmann. him in Argentina. Yeah. Eichmann. Eichmann. Uh, I've seen analysis. Eichmann got a more fair trial than Assange. Eichmann, the Zionists caught him, put in 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 a court by Jews of Jews, for Jews, in Israel, he got a more fair trial mm. than what the man of the people, Assange. And by the way, I would add to this, you said rape case, it's dwindled down to sexual harassment. <laughs> and and one of those who were accused her said she was tricked to it, she, she wouldn't accuse him of anything. The other one uh, magically got a huge villa, castle in uh, Israel, so she's mm. obviously an intel asset, and WikiLeaks never had to retract one single story. Yeah. The only outlet I know in history who's been hundred percent correct all the time. Uh, do you do you have any inkling of how many leaks they've had by now? Because people just think about the well-known, the Iraq thing and the Hillary thing, but they've had regular leaks. For for decades now, do you have any idea of how much? No, I I don't know. Okay, I, I, there's several thousand at least I know. T- Ten thousand maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is uh, this focus on this uh, this uh, sexual thing, you know, it's uh, really ridiculous. They did it with Clinton too. Yeah, but some k- kind of different, but still uh, this idiotic how you can take a person just fine, smear him, his, yeah, uh, yeah. his uh, desires, and then you have him, you know. Yeah. Like uh, who, there's so many people around who has desires, so you can find anyone. My 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 predecessor in uh, in Morn Brother, which I ran for ten years, he was actually uh, getting some information on some of the sexual things by a politician, and he was saying to this uh, journalist, you know, this is the is the same desires on the left side as in the right side. We cannot just go after that. They will find something everywhere. Mm. And I've been living by that for being a newspaper editor for nearly 30 years. I'm not going after this kind of sexual things, this intimacy zones. That's not very fine. Find the things. That's just deceptions. And that's clever because in that way, journalism can be immune against smear jobs, hack jobs, which has the, 
you know, they present something juicy tabloid scandal, yeah, yeah. but the real intention is political. So you won't be, if you stick to the case, you won't be influenced. But the Assange story is even different than stuff like, you know, traditional, like, oh, Clinton got a blowjob in the White House. Yeah, or Trump or whoever, yeah. There are such things, it has to be said, because there's so many people who fell for that propaganda. It was a completely invented smear job, which we now know. That's why they dropped. First off, when it came to the court for the first time in Sweden, it was dismissed and ridiculed by a female judge. Said this has nothing to do in court. Then the government in Sweden under, what's his face? The, is it Carl Bildt, I think? the oligarch, yeah. they uh, put up a special prosecutor who revived the case. This was obviously done on behest of Pentagon and CIA. So they blew life back in it, threatened and bought off those two girls. And it was no, not even rape. That was wrongly reported. It was sexual... Um, uh, I, I don't re- know the, the American terms. It's like a hierarchy of grievances. At the bottom is sexual innuendo or something. So it, 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 it started with not even rape, but uh, something a little more serious than harassment. And today it's dwindled down to innuendo. And like he talked dirty to me kind of thing. But they're not interested in that case anymore because the point with that case all the time was to get an extradition to America. So they need an excuse. And that's why they went to Sweden and got it. Now they don't need it because they've extracted him from the embassy, right? And yep. now he's going to be directly delivered to America, not even the route via Sweden. But the reason they did this is very clear. Uh, in the beginning, Assange had the uh, support of the left. Then, and they realized we can't crush this person if 50% of the population is behind him. And, and their right already was against him because he revealed some stuff on the bush. So, and the minions, the right back then wasn't as power critical as they are now. Now they are more matured. Now they have become anti-war and all that stuff. But back then they were complete drones for the bush stuff. War on terror, they were following. The left was critical. So what did they do? They took up identity politic thing. Like, oh, he's been bad against women. And it worked. They managed to erodate some of the support he had on the left by then. Then came the Clinton releases. And what happened then was that the rest of the left turned against him. I'm I'm talking about the drones, not thinking people on the left, but like just the masses. Hmm. Oh, he's partisan. He's for Trump and against Clinton. No, you know, they can't stay. They... They've forgotten the old journalistic value of expose all sides. This is the emotional audience, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and but ironically, he got some new support from the right, <laughs> the new right, the alt right, because they were also partisan, and they realized, geez, this helps Trump, so uh, he can't be that bad. But bottom line, all in all, he he lost lots of popular support, and uh, case closed. They got what they wanted. That's how I view those cases, those hit Mm. pieces. Here in Norway, the Sweden thing has been much bigger than it was in America, Australia, United Kingdom. Many people are not even aware of the Sweden thing, but we were very propagandized about it. Uh, And it worked. It worked because like Scandinavia, they view it as very liberal in the original meaning of the word, like freedom and, and hero sides. But... We are compromised too. It worked. I mean, this this shows how you aestheticize politics or or criminal the criminal thing, you know. Yeah. You just make it look like something. I mean, this, the, all the years in the embassy in London. I mean, he was this was making him as this kind of guy who's hiding. Mm. So Sweden is really important. If Alström and all and these people around there had dismissed this and said this is no, we are not doing anything. Just let him free or something. Mm then uh, we wouldn't have this situation we have now. Right. It's so uh, so much as a setup, as you can see, you know. Mm. We also wrote in ET just this, uh, th- about this protest that some Swedish people now is de- was delivering to the foreign department or the, the departments of uh, Sweden, where uh, Arne Rutt, he was actually, he's in the advisory uh, council in, in my newspaper. He was the chief editor 
in Dagens Nyheter was daily for so many years. Oh. Until he, and he was one of the honest journalists. He was attacking the owner, actually, by some. He was disclosing something about the owner of the newspaper, mm. and he was kicked out. So, so this kind of people who is uh, following truth, they are still trying to say things. But this is leading us to, to a big issue of mine, which is this: How many people do you need to hear this truth? Right. To get a change, you know, right. this is something that's maybe. What's we are your number? What? What's your number? My number. I mean, the <laughs> it's it's sometimes they say that it has to be ten percent to to find out the truth. Mm. And uh, this extinction rebellion, this uh, ecology, this uh, environmental organization is saying three percent to no. get a tipping point where things is turning. I'm not quite sure. No, it's what more. What do you think yourself, Al? I think it's uh, about 25%. Yeah. If you have 25%, you'll have a revolution. Oh, maybe. Yeah, who knows? You you need so mainstreamers on board. It depends on the case, you know. If it's yeah. uh, if if you really see all around you that every everything is uh, is going to hell, like uh, food and everything, uh, f- people become running for listening. If if they are okay and there is uh, a totalitarian regime coming gradually to take over, people is not r- running to listen to you. Yeah. So there's there's very different, you know, actual or long term things. Good point. Mm. In America today, unbiased opinion polls shows that 79 percent, including people in the Republican base, are supporting universal health care, like for example Medicare for all. Yeah. 79%. It's, yeah. it doesn't get traction in the politics because of the point you just made. Um, in a free society, it would be very easy. The more rigged and controlled, I mean, you have overt tyranny, like, like Saudi Arabia, right? A dictatorship, uh, through and through. But you have also, you know, the brave new world rather than 1984 kind of world that we see in America. Yeah. And, and so you have, like I think it's even more people supporting the federal legalization of cannabis mm. still doesn't get traction. That's because of strong vested interests. For example, the cannabis case is threatening the prison industry, private prison industry. The universal health care, every country in the world has it, not America, and in a pandemic... And that's threatening insurance companies, even hospital corporations and, and stuff like that. So, so there is, yeah, you're right. We have to take into the equation power structures in addition to opinions. I mean, if you are a politician who got a billion for doing a marketing campaign that got you elected, there is a payback time. So if you were chosen by people without this payment or all these big corporations or whoever supported you, you are free in a way. Yeah. But still, there is a lot of dependency in if you are in a party too, you know. If there is 30 people around you who is in the same party and saying we have to be agree on everything we say, so then you don't have the the kind of open, free discussions, uh, at least not with the people of the nation. So there is so many things that's uh, that's uh, limiting yeah. the free. Or, or maybe this majority of the healthcare or the Obamacare or whatever, who should have been impl- implemented because the majority is for it. Mm. That's a, a kind of absurdity, huh? isn't it? It is. But, you know, there are some platforms where that free discourse takes place. And that's podcasts. <laughs> yeah, like this one. <laughs> like this one. Yeah. We are discussing it. And that's why podcasts are taking over. That's why uh, you're taking Rogan. over, you say. Yeah, really? Pardon? Are you thinking so? that's my point? You know, we need more than this 25% or the 10 yeah. or, or the 3 to make this happen. I'm I'm a little uh, pessimistic about that. I'm not sure if that's maybe is it happening in 500 years from now or is it really mm. going to happen at all because of the entertainment or the egoism of people, like we were saying in the first part of this. Yeah. Do you really believe that, Al, that, that we will get a majority? To, to find out what's really happening around this, these major things. I'm not sure. Yeah, under one circumstance, under one premise. And that's because the oligarchs of the past knew something. 
they learned a lesson which was very valuable, which our contemporary oligarchs, they're so inbred and degenerate that they've forgotten. And that lesson is, if you want to fool most of the people all of the time, you have to keep them subdued by the carrot, not by the stick. Meaning, if they have a standard of living which is good enough for them to tune out, then all bets are off. If, however, you are threatening people's material well-being, hmm. that's when you're digging your own grave. That's when you can invoke Marie Antoinette. And that's exactly what's happening in America now. 50% about to lose their homes. It's, it's a huge crisis going on there, which didn't happen in Europe because all our governments bail out the people in addition to the corporations. In America, it's been the biggest looting we've seen. It makes 2008 look like a communist rebellion. <laughs> it's going to go into the history books. And Americans, America is going to explode one way or the other. It may be like a, a third thing that triggers it, like the Black Lives Matter thing against police or mm. something else, like or, or like a protest uh, against the election that happened. But... The shit is going to hit the fan and it's just a matter of time. And, and you and me will be around to discuss it, <laughs> to put it like that. Yeah, let's be a little optimistic about that. I was in Cairo yeah. when the Arab Spring was happening. I was sh- shooting film in, in Tahrir Square mm-hmm. where uh, these masses of people were revolting, you know, like you say, when there are, when it's too bad around. Mm. So Mubarak was, uh, was fall down. I could see they were taking off helmets of the soldiers or the police and throwing it through the air. They were so massive, all these people running around with the with banners and everything. I was I was there with my cameras. Nice. And and it was very nice, very optimistic. We were singing together, you know, this kind of revolution is here, you know, mm. in two thousand and eleven. And what happened after? We got these Muslim brothers, which was maybe the kind of brotherhood that we needed, like the Palestine thing also with the with Hamas and these connections. That was maybe more truthful in some matters. Mm. And there was maybe a setup, something happened, and they were, and they didn't do the right politics either. And then they were, they were thrown out, and then we got uh, Sisi yeah. back. Yeah. And now we had the same authoritarian regime or even worse, controlling... No. And maybe and worse, yeah. yeah. So this optimism for yeah, but still there's others. Yeah, let's have, let's look to the good ones. Yeah. yeah, but if you look at Tunisia, it kind of the same mechanism. But I think the big difference is that in Tunisia, there wasn't vested interests. NATO, Pentagon, all these bastards, uh, global mm. oligarchs, they weren't that vested in it, so that were allowed to kind of play out. Whereas in Egypt, they needed complete control. Uh, I, I think that's something to do with it. Look, we've been going for two hours already. Time is done already, yeah. Time is fast. Already. Yeah. You see, time flies when you're having fun. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, this yeah. is why long form works. Yeah, interesting. But we're not done. I, I won't let you go yet. We have one okay. uh, big topic I want to address, and then we'll wind down by discussing your projects. But the big topic I think you need to address before I let you go is uh, fake news. And uh, when I say fake news, I mean manufactured propaganda, either from the top or from the uh, people. That's a big problem in today's world yeah. when we talk about, because I think it's a good thing that we have a million voices and that you decentralize news outlets and that you crowdsource and people fund outlets, even old school outlets like yours. But on the other hand, you have this problem with so-called fake news, and that will also lead to call for fact checkers, and then the fact checkers are corrupt. And I mean, it's a whole, it's a, such a complex problem. But I, I want your take on it. Yeah, I have something to say about that because I was, um, yeah, you, you can say in uh, back in philosophy there was this trend called positivism, which is not about being positive, but by always coming with evidence for everything you say, or you will not be believed. So when you are putting out something that there is uh, several reasons, you say, but not evidence that this is true, then you have to, like me, I would say, then we put it in print. Then we put it in the newspaper. This is something we are very skeptical about. There is something happening here. And there is a lot of 
points that's pointing to this, like 9-11. Mm. That's enough for me. And I was attacked because I couldn't prove what we were saying. So that's the other part of this fake news, that if you are not 100% true, then you can be totally wrong. And we have this institution in Norway called uh, Fakta.no. It's like the facts, which has been popping up here and there. This is owned by four of the most... Uh, the biggest the newspapers, they own this little institution on the net called Fakta.no. It's ridiculous. They, yeah. And it's so ridiculous. And you say, where is the fact checkers checking the fact checkers? Mm. And we were attacked like this is totally not true. That was the sentence about 9-11 because we were, you said, you are guilty by association. They found a kind of, what was it, a journal who was paying some other contributors uh, and one of these guys or one of the guys who were talked about in the in the big, very big article. So if you just find a kind of half of a percent, which is maybe a little, you can be skeptical if it's true or not, then the totally 100 percent is untrue. Mm. And this is not, I mean, it's not logical at all. They don't know what about what facts and fakes are when they say things like that. This is totally untrue then everything is not true now. Mm. So we, that's a one, one part of this new thing. If you cannot prove what you say, you should not speak. Then you lose the platform. Mm. So that, that's happening actually like it did with us. On the other side, f- when you're producing fake news like uh, or, or this kind of um, emotional things like Trump is doing on Twitter, you know, we can... After a while, you like some people like this guy who is, looks like he is honest. He's talking when he finds a reason for talking or wherever he has emotion, mm. he tweets out things, you know. Mm. And after a while, people start believing the thing he's repeating and repeating. So the fake, but this is a problem again, which I'm coming back to and back to, of the audience. When you have an audience who is not educated or doesn't have the urge to look into things, they are lazy or they don't, they are all the things in their lives to look for, then, then suddenly these rumors is catching ground and suddenly people believe in things that's totally untrue. Mm. So, so it's not only the CIA or whoever who's producing or setting up things against the Assange or whatever it is. It's also about the audience out there, and that's why I have trouble about believing in the majority, actually. I'm not a socialist because of this. Mm. I don't believe in the proletariat taking over, for example. Mm. Uh, uh, so I'm looking for not an elite, but I'm looking for the, the people who can really take and sit in the European Union or in the United Nations. Have, if this can get more power, maybe we can have a better world. You're an idealist, that's for sure. I'm an idealist and also an anarchist who believes in the local democracy or small communes that can see the... Yeah, but that's that's kind of the opposite, because when you talk about United Nations or Mm. uh, multi-structures from the top, it kind of goes against the decentralized autonomy. Yeah, that's interesting, but but I will explain. It's uh, that the the top should only care for the big questions, like ecology, uh, minimum salary... Uh, tax evasion and these kind of things and then you let the local this is localism global and local mm-hmm. at the same time you put the responsibility of the local things back to the people like uh, communities of 10 20 000 people they will see the rich guy who's ashamed about being too rich and they will see the poor guy who's hungry you know because they see each other yeah. this is very important about anarchism and and the big structures is a kind of cosmopolitical thing Take care of the big questions, the unfair things. So if we live in a community and they decide to put up windmills here, who should decide that? Should it be a, uh, what's folkavstamning in English? Um, you mean a people's vote? That's a, Yeah, should it be like a, the community should vote for it or should it be the over mm-hmm. structures who decide? Uh, I mean, if it's really shown that uh, it's it's ecological disaster, that should be on the big level, I think. I mean, if you go out in the sea and put up farms there, that's maybe better than doing and destroying communities, which yeah. is having these big things uh, and the sound and everything that's destroying the minds of people. Yeah. Yeah, because my philosophy is that if something impacts a community, the community should have a say. 
Yeah, but if there's greedy people, the majority is greedy, saying, "Hey, we can get a lot of short time, short time money, you know, and then we can maybe move to Gran Canaria after, and we leave this community. Let's get the money." Like what happened in Iceland? Yeah, I mean this kind of uh, greed, which I don't like, is maybe the majority has much more greed than this uh, this elite I'm talking about. This uh, this uh, spiritual, not spiritual, but kind of experienced people who is there for everyone, not for themselves. Unselfish yeah. elite. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish we could breed them in a tank somewhere. I mean, yeah, I, I could <laughs> nobody is immune against corruption. <laughs> I, I think I am. I think I am. Yeah, you, you sh- you see, there are a handful, but mm. that's why you're you're talking with me and not on CNN. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they, will, they don't want to talk with me. No, I'm no. too complicated. But but do you think the biggest problem with fake news is that anybody has a voice now, or do you think the biggest problem with fake news is the spin from the corporate overlords? I mean, if if you really can pay like a hundred outlets to push on with some fake news, then you have a lot of power. But uh, I think fake news has been there for for hundreds of years. Yeah. I mean, the rumors, you know, it's very easy. Like I talked with you about, there is much more attention of saying something that's bad than good. And when you find something you, or put he's a rapist or something, mm. suddenly you have so much power. So this is a rhetorical spin, you know, we can use everywhere and it's not a new thing. No. But it's so it's distributed in seconds on the whole globe now. So it's a very dangerous time, you know. For example, if there was some fake there was a fake news actually happening in back in Soviet when there was uh, a fake uh, alarm about nuclear weapons on the way to Soviet. Mm. And this documentary film that's showing this guy who was in charge, the military officer, he got an instructions, fire back. Wow. And 300 millions would have been killed that time in the 70s or something. Huh. And this happened if he had pushed the button. Because he got the order from the military boss that who was called, there's, you should act as the instructions. And he, and was, he, he refused to fire and back. And he refused. Wow. That guy refused. And later on, it was not, it was a fake alarm. So, so if, can you imagine if, if there is a split of a second that you have to react because before you get hit, yeah. hit, it's a very kind of dangerous world we're living in when news is going that fast. Mm. It's not, and also with the, the autonomous weapons, the drones, that's deciding by themselves. There's not a human saying, by my intuition, this 9-11 thing is not true. There must have been something more behind it. I don't believe in this news. Mm. This kind of human way of thinking should be, have more space for that's my that's mm. why i'm trying to make a newspaper for five to ten percent of the norwegian population you know mm. to make a little more space for that kind of thinking mm. good point okay so um l- let's um list now so you began uh your media dabbling back when was that after my study of philosophy and um, i made a computer company who was very successful back in my 20s I started it when I was 20, 34. I was starting my Morgenbladet, the morning paper, who was a daily from 1819 up to I bought it. Yeah, I'll just surmise here. So, so what happened then? You bought up this old distinguished, uh, it was out of print by that time, wasn't it? Yeah, it had uh, 50 or 100 uh, subscribers. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it was still, uh, it existing. was still out there as a daily and I made it into a weekly. And, and that's one of the oldest newspapers in Norway, isn't it? Yeah, it was the only one uh, from 1819 that was still living. Yeah. Wow. So we had a huge uh, archive. It was very interesting to see everything from the war and everything. No, I remember that time. I, I used, oh, mm. Occasionally, I, I bought more and blada. This was back when things, everybody wasn't doing everything digitally. So if I went to a cafe, I loved taking uh, a coffee. Yeah. Uh, my pipe, I smoked pipe tobacco back then, yeah. and more and blood. That was like a ritual. <laughs> in ni- from 1993, yeah. yeah, I did that. Yeah. yeah, and it was like a cultural, more emphasis, I would say, on culture than politics, wasn't it? Yeah, it was starting more as a cultural or, or 
or intellectual newspaper and uh, turning more and more into a political one. So the yeah. 10 years I was running it was, uh, it was really, uh, we, we had around 10,000 subscribers when I sold it. I left it totally exhausted. Uh, one year we had three. Okay. So you voluntarily left that ship. Yeah. It was, it was a little, uh, some quarrels inside and things. Uh, people was asking for more salary. I mean, or having a better situation. Mm. We had very little money. So it was hard to, to run it. Uh, and then actually a big institution, the freedom of speech, uh, uh, freedom of expression, it's called, bought it together with two other newspapers and they put something like two million euro into it. And it expanded into 25, 30,000 subscribers today mm. in the next 20 years. So it was, it was actually getting a lot of economical support to develop. Mm. So today it's the, the main weekly newspaper in Norway for everything. I mean, there's nothing else. <laughs> so you, you, it's thanks to you as an individual, we uh, have at least three outlets with a somewhat different voice than the mainstream in Norway now, in the old stream yeah. press. Yeah, I think uh, Mormon Valley is still keeping up uh, a lot of the good things, but it's also become more academic. Yeah. When I say intellectual, I mean, it's the honest guy in the street. Maybe you can use the word the populist, the, the guy who is thinking out there. The, the people who is uh, caring about the world and the society. Yeah. And some academics are not intellectual at all. They are just keeping on with some of the the, the facts. Uh, and it's not important. Yeah. No? We, we have a beautiful Norwegian expression. I don't know if we can translate it, but in Norwegian it is fag idiot. Yeah. Uh, uh, how yeah. on earth do you translate that? A nerd, yeah. A nerd. Well, a nerd. Say. That doesn't do it for me. But no, okay. it, it's too much a specialist who doesn't <laughs> see see outside his window. You know. Yeah. 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 That kind of people is reading more. More of those are reading more and better, but that's fine too. And we have a uh, Le Monde Diplomatique, which is still distributed in Class Company, which I put in there when I was doing that for ten years. But well, wait a minute. So you went from uh, the morning from paper, Blada. yeah, Morning yeah. to uh, Le Monde. Yeah, some few months later, I, I established uh, the, the Scandinavian or the Norwegian edition of uh, Le Monde Diplomatique. And that had never been in, in Norway before? No, no, it had never been in Norway before. Mm. So I was in Paris, I met these people there. And this was the kind of intellectual or a kind of political, uh, radical newspaper that a lot of people I met around in the world, you know, I've been traveling a lot and studying abroad, etc. They were talking about the only paper newspaper they were having or in print they were subscribing to was Le Monde Diplomatique. This was this was, was a help. status symbol, huh? Yeah, or it was <laughs> uh, good people. I met pe- helpers yeah. in, in Haiti in the earthquake there. They oh, were wow. actually people, that kind of people. Yeah. And not academics, but people who really cared about society. Right, right. That right. kind of people. So then when I went to Paris, I got this uh, license to make the monthly for the, for Norway and, and also Denmark, Sweden, Finland. Yeah. Mm. We have the same language, you know, in Scandinavia for everybody understands each other up here. I mean, there's a little different languages, but we can, they can read Norwegian in Denmark and Sweden. Yes, yeah, so there was contributors from different uh, Scandinavian countries. Yeah, some some of those were like that. But in my my third newspaper, uh, we are printing Swedish and Danish directly. We don't translate it to Norwegian. Mm. You uh, now you talk about new time. But yeah, new time or modern time. Yeah. But, but what about the transition from Le Monde to new time? Were you pushed out because of the 9/11 thing? No, no, at all, not at all. Oh, okay. I was, Good. I was. Um, I, again, you know, it's just, you are really striving when you are doing some something which is not mainstream mass media. You are really, it's always hard to get subscribers. Mm. Of course, what have we have been talking about. So, so I was actually, uh, how, how I left Le Monde Diplomatique because I wanted to go into being a filmmaker doing documentaries. So actually, I, I sold the newspaper to another newspaper here, a daily. And they, uh, and after a while, they were, uh, Oh, they, I mean, this, we are talking about 30 years, you know, it's hard mm. to remember all of it. But mm. uh, actually, they were running it for a while with my assistant as the new editor when I was traveling the Middle East with my cameras uh, to make films. So uh, we, 
actually saw it was not well take, taken care of, so I actually bought it back yeah. <laughs> with, with this uh, with my assistant. Oh, nice. as, the, as the editor and we uh, I was the, the director then and we, we got it into this class, classic company which is actually the, I think it's the, still the best daily newspaper here in Norway but they have some some flaws of course uh, and it's so Le Monde Hypnotique has for the last uh, 10 years or more has been inside there every month reaching 25 30,000 subscribers mm. so Le Monde Hypnotique is important here in Norway so these three newspapers, uh, which I was actually establishing. But wait a minute! Didn't didn't you say that Klassikampen ousted uh, Le Monde after the 9/11 reports? N- no, no, that was needed. Oh, I, okay. I got both my newspaper inside that daily. Oh, you got both of them in, okay? <laughs> yeah, both my monthly was inside there for two, three years. Okay. Or when I when I was got my job in Nytid. Because it was very hard to finance these documentaries I was doing in the Middle East, so I was looking for a new job, and then suddenly this this one came up with a, with a with a rec- requirement to buy the shares actually. So we were oh. some people buying the shares to get it back on track. It was uh, very very well down uh, when we took over. Yeah, because back then it was a struggling like an old. It was a party paper for the old Socialist Party or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, in, in, in a way, it was the, the party solid out in 2006 and the next uh, 10 years. It was striving to, mm. to be something. Uh, yeah, I remember I, before you took mm. over, it was like a magazine kind of thing. It was a tabloid, which yeah. was not read by many. And it was striving and it was... I mean, it didn't have the money to, to operate. And, you know, with some experience as I have to run the kind of low budget things, I was actually in a way getting it back on track. And one of my, my shareholders, the, 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 the chief on the, on the board, he actually inherited some money which saved us after 9-11. Or else they would have killed that newspaper by throwing us out. You, you, you mean after the 9-11 reports? After the, that one, when we we were thrown out of class company, yeah. he put some money into the paper to save us. That's great. It's like intercept. I mean, you ne- really need some money, and now yeah. we are about making it by ourselves. Yeah. So, so you're you're kind of viable today. I mean, we are all viable, but uh, but uh, we made it into a, a new team, which I started in 2016. Or restarted, you can say. Mm. It's today. It's a magazine, a book magazine, which is coming out quarterly. But we shouldn't forget my my fourth uh, magazine, which is Modern Times Review, which is a right. which is the only European documentary mag- magazine today in print. And that's in English. It's in English, and it's put inside Nytid every four time a year. And uh, it's around in 20 documentary festivals, so it's very important. And uh, that's my other arm, you can say. I'm doing two publications mm. now. Yeah, yeah. So, so Modern Times Review, um, it's a news outlet about documentaries? It's most, mostly a review, which is, uh, mm. so it's, uh, I mean, it's about 200 selected films a year, which is reviewed uh, and the review is more an essayistic one. It's not like just saying what this is. It's I, I have 15 writers who is really well thinkers. They are commenting, uh, they are conveying what the content is, and they are and they, like for example Idfa, which is in Amsterdam, the biggest documentary festival. They put out three and a half thousand copies of the, my magazine in the bags of the professionals coming there in Amsterdam. So it's really important, this magazine, and it's political because all these cor- courageful documentary directors around, they are really doing a big job pro bono. I mean, most of them are not earning money at all, mm. but like, but they go into war zones, they go around. So this is the new, that's very important for me to say that this is the new investiga- investigative reporting. It's done by documentary mm. directors around. They are putting three years of their lives into making a documentary, which is disclosing some power games going on. And we are picking out those kinds of films, not the me, me, me films, the, the political no. films. Right. The magazine is biased into the political films. 
Right. It's very important for me to do that too. Yeah, and I, I really commend you. Uh, it makes all the sense in the world because when I think back to, let's say, a, a thing like the serial thing, then I remember many of the independent journalists there were also documentary filmmakers like Vanessa Bealy and Eva Bartlett. So mm. there is this, yeah, there is a zone where they overlap kind of. Because the old guy with the, you know, with a pen and a notepad and <laughs> feather in his hat, he's gone. It's all about the visual media these days. So, uh, yeah, it is in a way. You, you cannot yeah. use text. I mean, my daughter is not reading books, but she's really out there on the internet, you know, picking up information, talking with 30 friends. Yeah. I mean, so the audiovisual is taking over in a way, and you should be there. You know, you cannot just sit there in your old castle or no. ivory tower and say, listen to me, you know. Mm. So I, I took my hand camera and went out and do a lot. Uh, for example, if you ask me about the, the films I was making, I was yeah. in the Middle East interviewing 15 prominent women or interesting women, authors, uh, professors, activists with the Arab Spring about freedom. And they are, they are saying a lot of very interesting things to understand what they think about freedom. Mm. I was also doing, because we are from Oslo, I was doing the Oslo Agreement in Palestine, the Oslo Accords, and discussing this with uh, filmmaking. I was filming, filming a lot of the actors, yeah. <clears throat> the politicians that was doing things back then in 1993. And we have a seminar with 300 people here in Oslo, where I was showing clips about this and inviting the prime minister from Palestine, etc. Is this the Mats Gilbert film? No, this is not the finished film, actually. I was showing clips with some of the PLO oh, okay. people, okay. etc. Mm. And then, I, since I'm very interested in the Palestine problem, I was also making a film about a Norwegian doctor, Mats Gilbert, mm. who went to Gaza and saved lives when the war was going on from Israel, the bombings. And, he, and that's also out there on YouTube and Vimeo about Mats Gilbert. Well, I have to inject the Palestine case. That's another canary in the mine, like Assange or 9-11. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you try, you try on Facebook, put up something with Palestine, bam, it's going to be immediately suppressed. Yeah, it's so, I mean, I've been in Palestine six times mm. in Ramallah, meeting people. I mean, you can be, you can talk about the Jewish problem from the Second World War and you are in favor of Israelis, but when you get the facts on the ground, when you travel around there and see what's happening mm. and the harassment and all the soldiers and the military state there, you turn around, you know, mm. you have to see for yourself. That's the anarchist. You have mm. to go and see and think by yourself. You cannot believe everything you just hear in the mass media. Mm. But, but the, in that way, uh, documentaries are a good way for people who can't go and see for themselves. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's why they are so important. And they're actually coming up in more and more TV stations. People like documentary. They like the real thing. Mm. I mean, the fake news is something. But when you see things by yourself, of course, there can be biased things. But then you at least can judge a little more for yourself. Yeah, it's true. Okay, so so is there some site online where you put up your films? Yeah, if you go to to Neated, uh, dot no and search for Trills Lee, you will find my uh, there is a page there. Mm. So uh, you can find my my films. They are listed there, a lot of them, and they're mostly in English. Everything. Um, okay. You there? Hello? It has a Hello? kind of... Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, you uh, you got disconnected. I did. The last thing you said was if you go to Neated, you have a page of your work there. And then we got disconnected. Yeah, you, you can search for my name, Truls Lee, L-I-E-A. Hmm. And you will find me and you will find uh, a link to a page with all the films that's there. And also, the, the Norwegian newspaper Nitid has an English translated uh, edition, which is uh, kind of Google Translate, so it's not the best. But uh, oh. if you type in en before Nitid, en en dot n y t i d, 
Dot .no. Uh, .no. Then you will find the English version of my newspaper. Nice. But it's not perfect. It's uh, kind of Google Translate. No, it's better than nothing. I'm going to interview yeah. one of your uh, contributors. Uh, his name is Hans. Oh, help me out here. Hans. Hans Henrik Fafner. No, Hans Olav. He he writes about uh, Hans Olav. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also he, he he's not contributing so much now. He was one of the freelancers for yeah, with a lot of active, uh, good, inter- interesting article on the financial stuff and exactly. other things. And he and was, they and they tried to take him down, man. Oh, how yeah, they tried yeah, to take he him was down. well read by a lot of people actually. He, yeah. Of course, his background in finances and he's talking about uh, the money producing stuff. You know that's. That's a very interesting area that he can talk about, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to discuss how economics, how the bank system is a pyramid scheme and all that stuff. So it's going to, and he's going to tell his personal story too. I mean, he's been in the war. <laughs> yeah, he has met a lot of resistance in the, Oof. and the, yeah. the, the judges and the, the court systems. Yeah. They are, uh, uh, it's still run by people, you know. You, you, how can you trust everything? I mean, if you are having a kind of social liberal or more anarchist attitude to the world, you should always be skeptical to these governmental things. Yeah. We call it governmentality. Yeah, <laughs> good, good expression. <laughs> you don't yeah. like the governmentality. <laughs> That's right. Uh, speaking of judges, I, I've just actually been... Um, uh, conscripted as a judge, so I, I, I'm going to bring some justice in the Norwegian system. <laughs> okay, good. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, we still have some semblance of democratic echoes in the world, and in Norway, it's uh, we still have paper ballots, so important. Yep. And and we also have all vested interest counting. It's not just the two big parties. And for the law side, we have this popular jury judge thing, which is so important too. So, yeah. Hey, there's one, there's one question we didn't get. But, but let, let me add before that. Yeah, sure. We, we have been talking for a long time, but there is a lot of good things about Norway, of course. That's maybe why I also have my reasonable way of thinking because I grew up here. Mm. But I also learned from all the philosophers of Europe. But we should also know by all the money we got from the oil, some people, we also had an article about this. We called it the, the, the democracy greased with money. Mm. And that's a problem because we, it's all too well up here and you don't get the, all the people who's losing their jobs, like you talked about, mm. who's going to the barricades because it's silenced by all the money. Right. I mean, it's also good that in the COVID thing now that people have a salary from the state instead of going bankrupt but yeah. still how much critical voices can came out can come out of this you know when there is greased by money all over yeah. so the revolution is not coming from Norway it's coming from other places yeah it, it's coming from where they will feel the boot on their yeah. neck yeah I'm not a revolution I'm looking more for reforms revolution is an old term I don't believe in actually yeah or, or transmutation but it has to impact small, small ones yeah you know mm. what Cohen said it's coming to America first, the cradle of the best and the worst. Mm. I firmly believe that when America uh, crumbles, there will be changes because they have their tentacles all over the world, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's why I bother to do this in English and not in Norwegian because I can reach more people. I mean, we owe so much to America. I mean, the, the woman liberation, the Eastern attention. All of these things come is coming from the from the America, you know. Yeah. Although people don't know it. Mm. Good point. No, or maybe I, from China. We will see if China is coming up as something too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe not. Well, not the social control system they've implemented, <laughs> but uh, nah, not at all. That's not what we like as an anarchist. But but I, I'll give one thing for China. Uh, they are much better taking care of their population's material needs. Yeah. Yeah. We have to give them that. Um, but there's but one. not the Uyghurs. They are not. They are in concentration camps. So, who is the population here? Yeah? Mm. True. <laughs> Good point. But <laughs> okay, uh, uh, the, yeah. the, no, no. There's one more thing. But we don't have time to go in depth. So I'll just throw you a few questions. I, I wanted to discuss the overtone window with you. So I just have one question about that. Okay, we can try. Mm. Where is the limits of your? I guess I should say your public 
paradigm more than your private because in private people are really real but how far would you go in terms of what you would print what kind of stories what kind of topics what's what's your pain threshold there <laughs> for example I, I, i'll give you an example would you make an article about ufos no i don't think that's my uh, area of concentration Actually, I had this guy who was coming to me, knocking my door many times, mm -hmm. which I felt like he was. A, he made several books, and uh, maybe if one percent of that book was true, it was important. But it, but it was destroyed by the ninety-five percent of mm. of the ridiculous things. I mean, he was thinking that people was putting rays on him, so he fell down in the. And he was doing cross-country skiing. He was a good cross-country skier, but when he was 85, he fell in the in the hill. And he felt that people, there was somebody who was sending a race at him, you know. What do you mean? Oh, you mean uh, electric 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 impulses? Mm. So he fell. I mean, when you when you don't recognize that you are actually 85 years old, you cannot run downhill as you did before. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the that's the conspiracy, and he he was actually coming to me several times to make ask me to print things about this, right? And a lot of things. I I'm, I have my legs firmly on the ground. I don't think I will be convinced to this kind of guesswork. But there, if there is reasonable doubts, I can print things. But there has to be reasonable things. So so you're saying if the article is presenting. Presenting in a rational, uh, source-based um, arguments, arguments, like 11 did, yeah, yeah. Then you don't have a border for what you would publish. I mean, I mean, if I get an article with 10 assertions, my hair is racing on the head, and I'm throwing away the paper. I, I cannot just have assertions. There is so many labels. No, no, no. But but know? that's not the point. Uh, and I'm trying to see. Mm. Yeah, but I'm trying to see if you have some kind of ideological paradigm based overton window limit so let's say an article is very well funded not funded but founded uh, with uh, great references primary sources and presented rationally would any topic go and I, I, the reason i'm asking you this is that old stream media has uh, this a different kind of uh, limits and humans have different kind of limits mm. so it's very interesting to see where someone like you that we are i agree are a declared honest power a critical outlet even you have your limits and i want to find out where they are i can give you one example where i am um, yep. i'm open where most people are not and that's the the corona thing now mm. there is six thousand experts Doctors, professors, epidemiologists going out now saying that the PCR test is not as trustable as the governments are pretending That's or right. saying it is. Mm. It has, for example, it has, if there is an old virus who has died out in your body, you can test positive. So it, there can be a lot of false positives around and that, that can be contribute to changing the society into a, kind of disaster for the economic and a lot of poor people and at least and, at, and also the, the hungry people in Africa where there is a risk of maybe up to 100, 100 million people dying because of the infrastructure uh, or the help is not coming. Mm. So there is there is a lot of the cure can be worse than the sickness sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this this 6,000 people I, I heard uh, the speech of this uh, this guy, the professor, uh, I don't remember his name now, uh, something like light milk or something. Mm -hmm. uh, he he is explaining uh, with the references to a lot of research and professors about why this PCR test is making a lot of false positives. And that can be something to be printed, yeah. Mm. And it will give me a lot of trouble, of course. Yeah, it will. Uh, for some reason, this has become like a taboo thing too. You can't criticize. People are afraid, you know. Yeah, and it doesn't just give false positives. It also gives false negatives. That's the problem. That can also uh, uh, mm. There's something called the New Delhi study. It came out. Uh, it wasn't just like one single. It was like a huge team of 
uh, scientists, doctors, researchers, and they were forced to retract it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the reason is that it was too, what they found, and, but it's out there, so you can see, of course, it's out there. You can't suppress it once they publish it, right? But yeah. it's not officially out there anymore. But it was too heavy because when you read it, most people will conclude this is created in a bioweapons lab. This is natural. And one of the things they found is that COVID-19 is a splice of four different viruses, one of them from HIV. Mm, yeah. And, you know, you can't have have that. Uh, that's why it's so infectious. That comes from the HIV virus. Mm. So uh, they had to retract it. And, and this is like, you don't have to be a judge, in my opinion. You know, I agree or I don't agree. Suspension of belief is a very important principle in truth seeking. But you have to entertain notions. You have to investigate stuff to see open minded, like you say, before you even begin to make a conclusion. And that's the problem today. I think that, no, you can't even go there. You can't even touch a topic. Yeah. It's like from the outset, I mean, taboo. You should have a lot of free thinkers around to, to judge these kind of things. But yeah. for example, if uh, if Donald Trump is saying that this was deliberately made from the Chinese, so we should uh, cut them off from us, you know, that's also free speech. Yeah, but I, I think the idea here is that it was an accidental spill from a bioweapons that lab. Can, that can be possible, but it's also maybe not, you know, because there is some of the substance that's hard to find. I mean, there there is different... Researchers are saying different things here, so I'm yeah. not the expert to say. No, me neither. Yeah. But, uh, but the idea here at the end of the day is that, um, if it's uh, artificially manufactured, people have the right to know because it may lead to an uprising against bioweapons labs. And you know, of course, America has the majority mm. and the one in Wuhan, people think, oh, it's China. It's China's fault. That's not how it works. We had a journalist on uh, who explained, he said that all the bioweapon research in the world is huge cooperation. And America, for example, they want labs like China because they have rules and regulations from the old days. So if there's something they can't implement in their own country, bam, give it to CIA and they put it out in countries where there's no such restrictions like China. See what I mean? Yeah, they were back behind that. We on that with some of the American. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I want to put that out there. But you know, chatting with you have been an absolute pleasure. Um, I hope uh, you got sufficient time to express yourself. I didn't run over you too much. <laughs> no, I, I, I felt free. Yeah, I did. That's great. <laughs> but anyway, tusen takk for du stilte opp. Yes, yes. So thank you very much for coming on, Trolls. Thank you again for bringing up these kind of topics. That's also appreciated. Okay, that's it. Vi kan snakke i dagens vis. Ja, si fra en, en dag der Oslo, ta en kaffe. Absolut, mm-hmm. det kan vi gjøre. Vi må gjøre det. Ja, ja. 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 super. Snakkes vi. Ha det godt. Hei. Hei. So far today. Now, I have to give an important disclaimer. In the show, we happen to praise The Intercept as one of the independent remaining free press uh, in America, but that was done before we updated ourselves on the reality. See, after the conversation, it came out that Glenn Greenwald, who was a co-founder of The Intercept, and remember The Intercept was built up by his reputation and credit, and of course, since then, it has been taken over and compromised by the establishment tools, by the neoliberals, by the careerists. And uh, so he has resigned recently. Uh, very interesting uh, story. Uh, I recommend you can you, you can go to Jimmy Dore show on YouTube that I also praised in the show and check out the program called Glenn Greenwald Resigns from the Intercept Over Censorship, where Jimmy talks with another great journalist, Aaron Matei. And while you're at it, you may also want to check out his show called Why Journalism Sucks in America. But anyway, there they go through the entire case. 
And there you will learn that the current editor-in-chief of Intercept is completely compromised and doing the bidding of the establishment. And no wonder, like Jimmy said, Intercept is owned by a billionaire and so it's the way it goes. It just enforces my point about it has to be sponsored by the people or at least by shareholders who are, for example, the people who work in the in a paper or otherwise decentralized power, uh, decentralized interests, people with uh, ideals or whatever, like like in the case of Le Monde, and not some rich guy. And by the way, the billionaire who owns Intercept is the eBay founder, Pierre Oumidia. So we couldn't remember his name during the show. Um, so uh, the Intercept, no, it has been compromised. It is degenerated. It's uh, conducting censorship like all the others and it has been a fervent propagandist for the now disgraced and debunked Russiagate conspiracy theory hysteria up and so to the credit of Greenwald he he had to take the consequences of that and left so um, let's strike that from our consciousness it's not anymore among the independent, free, power-critical media. And it's so ironic that this was supposed to be like uh, an adversary against the national security state. And they, their editor-in-chief was duped into believing and pushing, as Jimmy Dore puts it, one of the greatest national security lies of our age. So, shame, shame, shame. But all the better for Greenwald. And they even tried to smear him when he outed them. So petty and pathetic and ridiculous, actually. Uh, embarrassing. So unprofessional. They, they try to, they think they are Washington Post. And I mean, like, the current version of the Washington Post. They think they are, like, um, an establishment elitist looking down one's nose at the plebs. Whereas in reality, they're ironically at the level of a high school paper. So immature, but we see through them. Now, I could list, of course, many other good outlets like uh, Truth Dig, but uh, I'll leave it to you to do the research and find those that suits you. But just remember the very important principle of source criticism. Even if someone has the right ideas or the right opinions matching yours, for example, it doesn't mean that you can trust everything they say. They have to do journalistic process, which is to vet the sources and give references so you can verify and stick to the facts. I'd like to sit all day long and fabricate fake news that are true in their message and essence, but without any facts. But as soon as you become dishonest like that, as soon as you use shortcuts and fabrications, because you think that the means are justified by the goal, you are compromised, you are corrupted, and doing your own case a disservice. So... Because truth is, at the end of the day, the real measurement of what we should adhere to. And those who put opinions, pet peeves, ideology, biases, whatever, above truth, just shows that they are no better than whoever else does it with a reversed stance. No, there's only... There's only the truth, and then there is all the different variations of lies around it. So always go for the truth, even when it is unpopular, especially when it is unpopular, and flies in the face of your own emotional attachments or fixed ideas. Lest we are gods and all-knowing, we have to adjust our way of thinking, our knowledge, our insight from time to time as we are merciless corrected by the truth. If you're not in the business of that, you shouldn't even listen to my shows. That's the only measurement that counts. Now, remember that we have expanded to all the podcast platforms out there, about everyone. 
Certainly the big ones. So whichever you prefer, let's say if you're into Spotify, look us up there or uh, Google, I forgot they have a new one, Google Podcast something, same with iPhones, Apple thing. Or whatever else you usually use, just search for us, Forum Borealis, and you'll find us there. Now, we use Podbean to launch them, but you don't have to subscribe to Podbean to find us. Uh, Stick to the app you already have. And uh, there, you'll notice we have released many more shows than on YouTube, but hopefully, when we have catched up with our website subscribers then we will uh, return to YouTube, which has been more or less stagnant the entire year. So we're going to get back to YouTube later. I'm guessing from uh, sometimes after New Year, we can go back to attending our YouTube channel. For as long as it remains, uh, censorship is growing. It's just a matter of time before we will be deleted from YouTube. But we're milking it as much as we can while we can. And to all you good fellows who suggest that we should expand to platforms like BitChute and uh, Minds and whatnot. Yes, we will uh, eventually do that. And I think Minds will be next, but we will not do Facebook. What's the point? All that work just to be kicked out eventually uh, during their final purges. So no, we will uh, go to some of these alternate outlets, but I don't have much hope for them. Like I said in the show, they're too narrowed, too sectarian. As for donations, know that we now receive crypto coins. We haven't really announced that uh, sufficiently. So if any of you want to contribute with crypto, feel free. You'll find the codes for our different uh, cryptocurrencies at our website. Now, let me read a few quotes. Edward Snowden said, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Napoleon Bonaparte taught us this lesson. A hostile newspaper is more to be feared than a thousand bayonets. Thomas Jefferson said, the only security of all is in a free press. Mukuma Mukunuana said, Freedom of speech gives us the right to offend others, whereas freedom of thought gives them the choice as to whether or not to be offended. Oswald Mosley said, Newspapers are not made any longer by news or journalism. They are made by sheer weight of money expressed in free gift schemes. They serve not the interests of the many, but the vested interests of the few. Oswald Mosley also said, The press will not be free to tell lies. That is not freedom for the people, but a tyranny over the minds and souls. Much humbug is talked on this subject. What is press freedom? In practice, it means the right of a few millionaires to corner newspaper shares on the stock exchange and to voice their own opinions and interests irrespective of the truth or of the national interest. Albert Camus said, A free press can, of course, be good or bad, but most certainly, without freedom, the press will never be anything but bad. Mehmed Murat Ildan said, Unless you have a free press in your country, there is no need to buy newspapers and there is no need to watch the news because there is no need to listen to the lies. And you already have one real information. You are being deceived by the people you are governed by. This is enough information for you. Bill Moyer said, A free press is one where it's okay to state the conclusion you're led to by the evidence. Oscar Orlik Ice said, If the media are to carry out their role as a fourth power in society, the necessary framework must be in place, including legislation that protects the confidentiality of sources and does not allow censorship. Free and independent media underpin any vibrant democracy. Jacob Riggs said, No custodian of the truth should have to fear the deliverance of the facts. And Jonathan Carl said, 
It struck me that there is a reason James Madison put freedom of speech and freedom of the press in the very first amendment. If we can't speak out, if we cannot challenge those in power, there is no guaranteeing the rights that follow. And final quote from George Orwell, who said, Journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations. And thank you for staying with us today. Thanks to my team and your support. I've been your host, Al. Until very soon. Be seeing you. Number one.